And we are live. This is Dark Journalist. Uh, it's great to be here with everyone. It's a big crowd already. And uh, we're moving into the X series. This is part 17. We're just coming off of the uh, kind of Steiner Revolution and the Real American Revolution episode from Wednesday, July 4th, which we got uh, great feedback on. And I want to thank everyone who uh, submitted so many interesting ideas and comments after that one. We have a obviously fantastic a group of people out there watching these shows and really uh, trekking along with us. Of course, I'm joined by the lovely Olivia. Hi, everybody. I was telling Olivia she's fast heading towards the most popular co-host <laughs> on the internet. And uh, if this goes on, we're going to have to do the Olivia hour. That's all mm -hmm. there is to it. Um, but it's fantastic to see everyone out there. Uh, of course, what we're doing here with the Dark Journalist X series is we're tracking the X steganography which is something that in my research came up um, over and over again when I was tracking these programs that had to do with these black projects. And um, very often they related to the space program or really advanced aviation. And um, very often those programs would go black and then they come back up and they'd have this X designation. And then you'd see this X popping up very unusual ways. So the more I did it, the more I did it, the more examples I collected. And at one point, I got over 100 examples, all the way up to 160 right now. Um, and what that means, basically, is that there's a secret program running, and that they use this process, which is steganography. And it's a little different than uh, cryptology, which is it's something that's hidden right there in plain sight so that you can see it, and it doesn't look unusual. And you wouldn't think anything suspicious was going on. And it's actually a smart way uh, in these covert programs to do this because what happens is you get these agencies together and they're working on a particular project. And um, so you might say, well, you know, how do we keep, say, 10,000 agents in the loop about something without giving them the real entrenched in-depth details? And the answer is use a steganography across the board that is something that's easily trackable, doesn't require a lot of explaining, and allows them to give you feedback without knowing the full depth of the program they're referring to. This is a crucial process, and uh, I think it's something that we've seen pop up over and over again in our research. Um, now, what's interesting about this is, of course, a lot of it goes to the UFO file, and we were finding out uh, from looking at the different presidents that were engaged in using this X process that they were keeping these series of X letters, I call them stealth archives, because we sure know that they're out there, but we don't know how we're ever going to get access to them. And one of them is the LBJ letter, uh, which is set to be released in 2023. Eisenhower's letter is 2053. That's a Project X time capsule. Uh, of course, we've looked at Nixon and JFK in this regard, and um, now it appears that there might be something involving Reagan, which I'm going to get to soon. Uh, we've seen the crisscross between Nikola Tesla's work and John Trump, who was the president's uncle, and uh, he was a professor, a very successful professor and engineer at MIT. Kind of fascinating process there that he got called in to examine Tesla's papers. Now, we have an episode which has over 100,000 views now. It's called Tesla and Trump. And um, what I go into there is the relation of John Trump to the Rad Lab. And the Rad Lab is something that I don't think is well reported on if you look at it through history. But the Rad Lab is something that existed at MIT to examine, say, advanced technology to try to win World War II. And as we went along in this process, we see that the same people show up around the UFO file. That is Vannevar Bush, uh, who was in charge of MJ-12, and these other individuals, uh, including the Comptons and um, the Varian brothers. They all move into this process, and the variants play into this episode today. Although we're talking about the crystal skull today, um, what we're going to find out is that the archaeology of going deep into how these processes work, the X starts to track back through history. So if we look at the real uh, blowout of the mystery schools in the 1870s and 1880s, where we got incredible people coming forward, like Helena uh, Blavatsky and like Rudolf Steiner and the work of anthroposophy, theosophy, the Golden Dawn, all these things came up all at once. And um, this was the response to the incredible scientific materialism that was developing 
and that hit, uh, according to Steiner in 1840, a crucial decision happened around these mystery schools where they decided, you know what's happening. We need to let more information out to the public than we have in the past, and we have to do that collectively. And there was a real rumble, a real war there about whether they should do it or not. But fundamentally, the idea was this, that there was scientific materialism taking over and that human beings were going to become mechanized and lose their soul, in essence, lose their spark, their inspiration, their spirit, and they were going to become part of this machine. Now, um, this whole wave was influenced by something that Rudolf Steiner called Arima, which is, um, you know, shows up as the traditional devil in so many religions, but he was really tracking him as this entity who was associated around using science to lock in humanity to a certain way of thinking, a certain way of processing things that would negate their spiritual aspects and leave them vulnerable uh, to his trick in the sense, which is that he was, you know, um, and this is goes deep into the, the mystic on this, but he was looking at it and saying, you know, the national natural evolutionary track of reincarnation through the planets, which is what happens when you leave here, that's esoteric doctrine. So if you look at Theosophy or Edgar Cayce or Rudolf Steiner, this is what you're going to find, you know, that you learn your lessons here in this incarnation, you move on, and the planets are like various schoolrooms, and you come back with all that knowledge. Well, according to Steiner, uh, the process was going to be upset a little bit because there was a process taking place since Atlantean times, um, which goes back to prehistory. We're talking back before 10,000 BC of these advanced cultures, and that they got so advanced that at a certain point they became destructive. And um, so there was a, something that got developed in this period that is referred to as the eighth sphere. And the eighth sphere would be kind of an artificial step in evolution, that these harmonic groups are really determined to get people to move into. Now, that mystery school knowledge going back through the work of Steiner, going back through the work of Theosophy and Blavatsky and all of this, brings us to the doorstep of this question of what is it all about? What have these mystery schools through history been about? And that ties us right back uh, to where we are with things like the UFO file and the X steganography, the same secrecy is at work using the same symbol, which is the X. So um, as we've gotten, uh, you know, as we got deeper and deeper into it, we're kind of looking at it now and saying, this is almost like the Rosetta Stone in a sense, because we have the ability now to read through their steganography, to see through them and the things that they were putting out to what the projects are and the things are that they're actually working on and what their reasons are, what their motivations might be. This is a crucial thing that's been missing in 70 years of people looking at the national security state in terms of the UFO file, um, but even longer in terms of how people have looked at the mystery schools because of course there's been a lot of secrecy there. Some, you know, uh, with, with good reason because they, they don't want to act irresponsibly and let this stuff out and have the public be sort of feasted on by these corporate forces. So we're in a very unusual and interesting situation um, that we've discovered something which is a key, which is the X steganography through history that is trackable as we've laid out in uh, 17 episodes here. Now, in part 17, which is where we are now, we're examining the Mayan mysteries, the crystal skull, the eighth sphere, and the battle of these harmonic forces to take North America with a foothold in the Mayan period. That's why we're going there, because we're going to be able to track this influence all the way back. And we're going to do it through the figure of Anna Mitchell Hedges, who was the daughter of this incredible uh, explorer, Mitchell Hedges. And he is the original inspiration for Indiana Jones. Of course, they made the Crystal Skull movie with Harrison Ford. And um, I think uh, this is somebody we should take a quick look at. Just an amazing figure here, who really was one of the first people to open up the Mayan ruins. And the thing is, uh, you know, born in London, worked as a stockbroker before he was an adventure guy, got recruited to be a spy. And um, now there's a lot of material, and I would say good material, dealing with the fact that he was working for Her Majesty's Secret Service. Doing these things in Central America that were based on kind of colonial interests, shall we say. Um, but a lot of 
his expeditions center around the fact that he had these connections. He was able to go into these places like Honduras and like Belize and Mexico and really work and develop relationships. He had a whole network behind him. So he may have been sent there to do intelligence work, but he dovetailed it into this other thing. And that's where it gets really interesting. Uh, Mitchell Hedges lived a long and very mysterious life. And he is really the guy who's the go-to for what we're talking about in terms of, uh, you know, when you think of when people kind of put out there, oh, like, you know, Zahi Hawass is Indiana Jones. <laughs> no, the guys like Hawass were like pencil pushers who were in charge of these projects. Mitchell Hedges was deep in the jungle, digging things out, working with people, developing the language, developing the background. Uh, during one of these journeys, this is another shot of him working on these ruins, which I find absolutely fascinating. And um, we'll talk more about the Maya in general as we get along here. But certainly Hedges, I think, is a very interesting character who really knew quite a lot. He even had a 1930s uh, radio show, which I got some recordings of, which is absolutely fascinating. A him going off about, you know, his different adventures and, you know, uh, being attacked by a tiger and things like that and being held uh, prisoner by um, Pancho Villa. He was kidnapped. Mm. He actually um, was around during these periods of the different revolutions, so he, he got a lot done. During Along the way, something very mysterious happened, which is um, he adopted, he got married and he adopted this teenage girl who um, was in Canada visiting relatives, and her name was um, Anna Marie Leguillon. And she, now, if you've been following this show, you know about the Orphic Circle, I make her a real good candidate for the Orphic Circle, which is why she was adopted as a teenager um, by Hedges and his wife, because there's a lot of unusual things hanging out there about how she was adopted and then bing, she's right in his main expedition as they go to the Yucatan. Uh, too many unusual things. And I will tie that in and substantiate it because we're going to find out that psychic archaeology played a big major role in all of the uh, huge discoveries that were going on in Mexico at the time. Uh, so on the, one of those trips, Anna Mitchell Hedges discovered something sort of glowing off the top of this hill when she went, when they were looking for these pyramids. And she's looking down, she sees something shining. And the story goes, they go down there and they find the crystal skull. Um, the crystal skull is quite remarkable for a lot of reasons and should be taken very seriously. It's not a hoax. There are skulls that appeared afterwards, which apparently were hoaxes. Um, but the Mitchell Hedges skull has an incredible background. And it, you know, it's they've tried to, I think, put it out there and say that it was connected to these other hoaxes. And we see that from time to time. But I can tell you that I'm the last thing from gullible on any of this stuff, and I've researched it really well. And there's no way that that's a hoax. It's something that the Mayans left there through traditions, and there may have been more. Uh, so, you know, maybe some came up after this one was discovered, but uh, in any case, there's a really good sol solid track record about the background on this. Very unusual skull. Um, I will tell you during the process of this show, a, a most enlightening and unusual personal experience that I had uh, that Olivia was present for mm -hmm. that was associated with the skull, quite remarkable. So that's going to be a little bit of fun that we have as we get in here. Uh, how are we doing over there, Olivia? Doing great. I have some amazing questions already. Well, you know, I can't wait. Actually, I'm going to get into a lot of questions with you guys tonight because the questions are just terrific lately. Again, you're watching Dark Journalist, and um, I want to recommend that you go to darkjournalist.com and sign up for the newsletter. Um, you know, it's kind of the best way for us to stay in touch. You and I need a, a kind of a pipeline that isn't interfered with potentially by something like social media. And, um, you know, even if there's a, a spam issue sometimes when the newsletter goes out, and they put it in your spam folder. Eventually, we, we get to you as we find out. Um, and that's the good thing. Quick thing about Anna Mitchell Hedges, what I want to show here. This is a very interesting 1977 special with William Shatner. Yes, that is Captain Kirk. Um, be still Olivia's heart. Yep. And uh, 
he's there with the crystal skull and i can tell you when you watch that it's called mysteries of the gods that he does not want to give it back and uh it is a fascinating little thing and whenever you see the crystal skull on video something very strange happens so i highly recommend that very informative uh, little segment that's another shot of it but you know um anna lived till 100 years old never changed her story and um you know her facts are very well verified and you'll see the different tactics that were used against her to try to get the skull and then you realize where a lot of these stories uh, come from that tried to negate the incredible influence of the skull and, and what it was uh certainly they had to do certain things to smuggle it out of mexico so um you know a lot of researchers have pointed to it and said hey it's not listed on as one of their items when they leave mexico well you know that's the way to get it away from the mexican government um and there's quite a remarkable story and a lot of people who were there when it happened, uh, you know, corroborated her testimony. So we don't need to deal with that aspect of, is it a hoax tonight? It certainly was real, but what was it? What was it for? Who was using it? And what was the tradition behind it? And how does it link into what we're talking about with the X and the whole Aramonic influence? Well, I can tell you the links are, are tight, <laughs> as we're gonna find out. Um, Let's take a look at someone who is not mentioned as much as Mitchell Hedges is, as far as the Indiana Jones aspects go. But in my experience, he was the core um, archaeologist for finding out about the Maya, and his name was Augustus Lipongeon. Augustus Lipongeon, uh, from a young age, had traveled all over the world, South America, the Middle East, and um, he had incredible Masonic ties, and he had an incredible mind for ancient cultures. And um, he wound up really putting it to the test and becoming the key figure for most of the pyramids and most of the things that we've seen uncovered in that period of the late 19th century. Um, Le Plongeon was the one who was there. He would have a psychic impression as he was doing his archaeology. It would hit him. And then he would say, let's strip that mountain of vegetation and boom, it happened to be a pyramid. And this is the way he worked in a nutshell. Um, very unusual career. He died in 1908, but before he died, um, he did have a very interesting meeting with uh, Mitchell Hedges. And that's where we're gonna find this tie to the X and the crystal skull. A Couple of quick things I wanna point out with him is that his wife was named Alice Dixon. And if you've been watching this program, you know that I've tracked the Mason Dixon line um, people and how their relationship to Gene Dixon. And it's this whole group in England called Dixon uh, who are always seem to be at the interface of all of this fascinating archeology. span And uh, so she went with him to the Yucatan. They did a lot of this uh, work together. Um, and it just so happened he was a great photographer. So he took some very nice pictures of her. Okay, I guess, um, what I want to point out is that there's a book that I just showed there called Sacred Mysteries of the Maya and the Kishi. And what he felt was that there was a group that came over and were called the Kishi who were from Egypt directly, sailed over and influenced the culture outright. And he also was a big believer in the Atlantis uh, story. And that was, was big central continent there between Egypt and Mexico on the other side. So Le Plongeon is someone who, because of his going to do this kind of psychic archeology, span is looked at, you know, he's dismissed by traditional archeology, span of course, but one of the things he claimed to do, and remember, this is a guy who's responsible for most of the major finds that we know. And, you know, he's the guy who opened up so many things like Yucatan. But he claimed that he solved the riddle of the Mayan hieroglyphs, which we still don't know what most of them mean. And in that solving that, it played out the story of Atlantis and Mu and those princes and princesses that came here and reestablished Atlantis. And as we find from esoteric sources, this stuff really gels together well. Um, he went to the American Archaeological Association with this in 1879, saying, I've cracked the code, let's get on with it. And they said, those savage Indians, how could they have done this? You know, that's not, they didn't have a written language. Those are all weird pictures, you know. And that's where his research languages to this day. Um, and he absolutely, I think, had an incredible 
influence on people like Hedges. Um, but the the word generally with Le Plongeon is like, you know, there was this kind of crazy guy who went down there um, and made up all these wild theories. But in fact, his work gets more and more substantiated as we go along. But when we look at the actual esoteric tradition and how close it is with Le Plongeon and how Le Plongeon was telling us that there's a Mayan, that most of the Mayan uh, images are associated with Freemasonry because of the influence of the Kishi who came from Egypt, bringing masonry to the Mayans. And that those, those Masonic brotherhoods are all incorporating um, that imagery. That is fascinating and breakthrough. And there are people who are doing that research right now. And I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of things along this line, um, because this is kind of a crucial avenue, I think for us. Um, Take a few more. Here's Le Plongeon in his Masonic regalia. Uh, a very intense guy, and you can see with the psychic archaeology, it's all in the eyes. When you really look at these people, it's very easy to tell who's fake and, and who's the real deal. Um, and Le Plongeon was a very spiritual man. I think that's the other thing that's very important to keep in mind when we do this. He wasn't out there looking for, you know, gold like Cortez, willing to chop people's heads off for it. Um, we're going to find that the things that tie in Masonic imagery, the things that he was looking at, saying this is definitely a Masonic tie-over, are, are pretty obvious. Um, but they're all wrapped up in the X, so we're going to find the Masons with the X with the Mayans before we get to the punchline. Let's take a look at a few of these. Now, these are some Mayan ruins. Um, they date to 200 AD. And we can clearly see the X here. This, I think anyone would agree, is the Masonic insignia. Straight across. And we have a tight comparison shot on this. Um, and I think it's very important to establish Le Plongeon's theory here before we go any further. Masonic regalia, the whole design, the X with it. Um, the X is being shut up <laughs> in this environment. They are locking the X away here. This is part of the Mayan mysteries that we're going to get into. And the X steganography is obvious. It is the message is keep that X hidden and keep it under control. And this is one of those kind of abandoned hope, all ye who enter type. Uh, Mayan sites, and what's happening with the X over here that we're looking at is this entire site is um, communicating that message that they are communicating with the dead, and that that the X relationship, uh, as they've found out over and over again on these monuments, relates to that other world communication. A few more shots of the same structure, and the X's are obvious here and the cross pattern of the bones. Um, I think this is just an overlay, obviously, but it'll give you an idea directly. And people are working on this now. They're seeing the things that Le Plongeon brought out in 1900. And he's right. I mean, that is obviously the same Masonic seal in the Mayan ruins. The question is, what is it doing there? Um, so, We've established now, here's, in the Mayan language, the X here is a creation verb. So it's the act of creating. Um, that's something also to keep in mind. But spirit communication is the overwhelming and overriding force of that X. And uh, just one last look at these pillars, the X with the Masonic symbol there at that Mayan site. Uh, so clearly, Le Plongeon was giving us the message you know, he was a master mason himself, and he was connecting these things. The Masonic groups in America didn't want to hear about it, and they did not want to hear about the, um, you know, the archaeological people did not want to hear that the Mayans had their own language and sophisticated things. They were trying to eradicate a group of Indians here and sort of, you know, minimize their importance. They didn't want to suddenly come out of the blue and say, oh, these guys had better astronomy and language than we did. 
they were better uh, mathematicians and so on. So it's an interesting kind of political game that was being played. Um, but now we're back to the skull, of course, which brings us back into what is the tradition behind it. So um, one of the things I want to tie in here is that the kind of tie over from the mystery schools letting out information about Atlantis and the earlier cultures, um, like Egypt being a legacy culture from Atlantis and the Maya being a legacy culture from Atlantis. The idea is simple, that there was a really advanced culture that Plato talked about that was beyond the Straits of Hercules. And um, they, you know, they were in the Atlantic Ocean. It was a, a continent with an advanced culture that had advanced technology and really, um, you know, kind of ruled the roost. I mean, there was nothing quite like it on the earth. It was the dominant culture, very much like the United States is now. And um, one of the things that happened with that was there was a big split inside. There was a group who were the followers of someone called Amelius, who was the first real true enlightened um, Atlantean who had, um, you know, come with a, a mission to unify their great advances with technology, with the spiritual vision. And Amelius comes up in the Casey work and we're going to use Amelius as kind of a shorthand for that whole group of people in Atlantis who are using this kind of spiritual technology. If we don't understand Atlantis in terms of spiritual technology versus uh, traditional physical uses of technology, then we're not going to understand what happened back there. Um, and so as we go into this, one of the things we need to keep in mind is people like uh, Steiner, are letting out the information saying, well, there was a big tug of war about whether or not to let this Atlantis information out inside the mystery schools. And it got out because as, as part of the process of letting people know about the psychic information or information relating to the kind of esoteric history, Atlantis was a big factor in it, especially since mankind was about to discover flight there uh, in the early 20th century. So, the mystery schools are looking at this and saying, we're going to have to let this out. And if you look at the schools as they come out, they're all talking about airships, 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 everywhere you turn. Uh, Bulwer Lytton's information uh, is a great novelist in English culture. Um, you know, Annie Besant, Helena Blavatsky, Steiner, they're all talking about it. Um, so, you know, when we're looking at this theme, coming out over and over again. We can see the mystery schools are behind it and they're pushing it. But the idea is not, hey, we're going to have great airships. The idea is we had great technology. We had the high achievement. We had the airships. So the airships is, is also a kind of a shorthand, in my opinion, because they're referring again to this kind of X thing that happened. And when we go to Atlantis, people talk about it as an incredible devastation that took place. And, you know, everyone always thinks it was a meteor strike. It was all these different things. But the way they describe it, uh, that is that man became gods and then this thing happened. Um, I've tracked this effect that they're talking about there in Atlantis and that the mystery schools refer to. And I track it as the same effect that we're talking about when we go after the UFO file and the strange reality distortion things that happen. It's just an extreme case back there in Atlantis. Um, where time itself shifted. And so we're looking at a very unusual situation. I call that effect apothium. And that's so I can kind of track that effect in my head. So for our purposes doing the X series, apothium is, it's like when uh, an ET contactee comes in and says, oh, I lost six hours. And we've had some of the best cases. They always have missing time. And very often we'll find that, you know, machinery won't work and cars will stall and all these different things will happen or people will find their clothes on backwards. We've heard about those and people have said, well, the, you know, the aliens didn't know what was going on and they kind of put their clothes back together wrong. No, sorry. I mean, aliens are probably pretty observant if they're doing all these tests. It makes more sense that something is taking place in terms of a reality distortion effect that is upsetting the time, the electricity, people's clothing. I mean, their sense of time and all these things. Now, why is that connected with seeing, you know, a craft or say like a mystery aircraft if we're just making these craft? 
So obviously there's something in the UFO file relating to this apotheum, and that's what the big secret is about. It seems to me, uh, and if, as we've tracked uh, the case with John Keeley and Nikola Tesla's work, there was something that they were trying to suppress on the corporate side about uh, their work because they were really afraid that this stuff would come out and free energy would be out there. But oddly enough, it appears that also the mystery schools were trying to keep Keeley's work down. Um, and there's a reason for that, which is that this whole apotheum effect in the wrong hands can do incredible damage to evolution here on Earth. So we have to look at this from a much deeper uh, perspective and see that the greedy secrecy is one thing. Um, and we see so much of that in government and in these financial circles. But the mystery school secrecy is more like, how do we guide humanity, you know, and this kind of a thing. So we, we get into um, different levels of secrecy and what they're about. When we go further back and we see the Mayans shutting up these sites and sort of burying the X and, you know, alluding to this whole thing with it, we get a better idea of what the secret societies and the mystery schools are dealing with. Some of the mystery schools are certainly coming from a benevolent place and then others would really, the more information they use, the more advantage they get. And those things are deeply interwoven uh, with our political process, for example. Okay, we're gonna move on a little bit here. Uh, how are we doing, Ms. Olivia? We're doing great. Excellent. I wanna tell everyone that you're watching Dark Journalist and um, this is gonna be incredible because when we piece together the idea of Atlantis, the mystery schools, and the Mayans, and the Masons, then this whole process becomes easier for what we're looking at in terms of the X. Um, so let's touch base real quickly on the basic facts of the crystal skull. Okay, so um, now I want to recommend a few books on this first. Um, this is an excellent book, actually, Richard Garvin, The Crystal Skull. Straight ahead, gives you the background, and um, it tells you a little bit about how the Mayan priests related to the skull. I think it's fascinating. Of course, this one also. Um, this is David Hatcher Childress's book, and it's got some of the wilder theories about it, but I enjoyed it. And we will, uh, we're going to be referencing off and on here their, their research on it. But let me read this. Most widely celebrated skull, a crystal skull, is the Mitchell Hedges skull for at least two reasons. It's very similar in form to an actual human skull, even featuring a fitted, removable jawbone. Now, this is interesting. The other skulls don't have the jawbone, and it is something that they found separately. At first, they found the skull, and then a little while later, they found the jawbone. Now, there's a lot of indications that the crystal skull was something that actually would become animated at a certain point. So an initiate circle would commence, and they would get information from somewhere, through the skull. And that the skull, of course, when we think about crystals, we think about memory storage and people who are really technologically inclined know how important those crystals are uh, for storage. But when you think about the actual crystal skull and embedding this information down tradition to tradition, one of the traditions that they had for the skull was that, and this is something that Anna Mitchell Hedges said that the priest told her dad, was that when the um, sort of the shaman of the tribe, the main shaman of the tribe was getting old, he would download his information into the skull in a kind of mind merge. And then they would get the young sort of hierophant clairvoyant that they've identified inside the tribe. And they would have them both lie down with the skull in the middle. And during that process, the old man would pass away and he would transfer the knowledge through the skull and the boy would arise and he would have all the knowledge of the, so it's a very different, it's kind of a significant kind of thing uh, that you could say the process is different, but it sounds like the Orphic Circle a little bit, doesn't it? So then the young boy would have the mastery of the tribe. Um, so there's, there's things about it where they say, well, it was the skull of doom and um, that's kind of the popularization. Interestingly enough, it's actually there to ward off those types of influences. And I'm gonna get into how that happened. Now, there was, a, um, there was a thing that happened when Mitchell Hedges died, he passed the skull along to Anna. And um, 
you know, the story about it, I think, makes a lot of sense for me. One of the things I found out that she did is she passed it along to her friend who was an art historian. And, um, you know, she was kind of, uh, I think, entrusting him with it and hoping that he could find out what its secrets were. And she'd spent so much time with it. But uh, his name was Frank Dorland, and he was given permission by um, Anna Mitchell Hedges to submit the quartz skull to tests conducted at Hewlett Packard Laboratories in Santa Clara. Why is Hewlett Packard so important to this? Well, as we have put out there in a few episodes, the Varian brothers are crucial link to advanced technology and the mystery schools. Um, they came out of Halcyon. Their father was John Varian, who was the main theosophist from Ireland, who founded a colony out there called Halcyon in California uh, under the instructions of Annie Besant, who was the leader of theosophy. And the entire community was under the um, leadership of Master Hilarion, who was a satiric being, who was kind of associated with major scientists. Mm. One of the best ways for us to look at this is that the Varians came out of the theosophical tradition of science. And in fact, uh, they were the ones who discovered the klystrum. And as a result of that, um, we had microwave radar and some of the advances there that helped us win in World War II came right out of their laboratory. Now they would work and develop their own particle accelerators. So when we hear so much about CERN, we can have these guys to thank or not thank. Uh, as the case may be, but certainly they were right in the, the heart of the whole thing. Now, who was it who got started at Stanford through the Varian brothers? Hewlett Packard. So this idea that Hewlett Packard had this kind of larger than life esoteric knowledge as well as technological knowledge plays in very heavy here. Um, so always keep the Varians in mind when we're talking about mystery schools and high tech. It, it helps a lot. I, every time the dots always seem to go back to them over and over again. One of the things that they found, uh, Dr. Snow, I was amazed to observe, and this is in a book called Atlantis and Lost Other Worlds by Frank Joseph. Um, they were uh, observing the, uh, the teeth, and they were, <laughs> they were trying to get uh, some very interesting uh, dental scans on the teeth because they, they were really found this part remarkable. One of the things that they found in the surface of the left side of the mandible, the first molar showed an X on the surface in the crystal skull. So there's a there's an X when they're doing these close X-rays inside there. There's an insignia buried deep inside the skull, according to this report. Um, but there were other rather fascinating things. They figured out that one of the things that the skull was capable of the way that they would sit it is that it could move side to side as if it were actually speaking. The other thing was that at times it seemed to affect light so that when the room would go dark, it would basically glow in the dark. Uh, it could affect different conditions. Anna Mitchell Hedges talked about how at one point it created a rainy, moist environment inside of her uh, apartment and it would also uh, have the ability of people would, you know, put their hands on it and they'd obtain healings or insights. I mean, this thing was an incredible artifact uh, in any case. But in our case, it's related to what we're looking at with the ex steganography One of the things that Le Plongeon wanted to tie in with the Masonic imagery was this scene uh, that he says here, a few centimeters above the lintel of the entrance to the mine sanctuary is a cornice that surrounds the whole edifice. On it are sculptured these symbols, many times repeated. On the under part of this are small rings cut in stone from which curtains were suspended to hide the holy of holies from profane gaze. Very Ark of the Covenant kind of thing. But these images, um, anyone in Masonic imagery will agree, are pretty common in masonry. So again, Le Plongeon's idea of the X being associated with the Mayans and the um, Masonic influence on the Mayans early on, way before uh, the Mayan school was founded. 
So um, we're getting into this territory. Where we're starting to understand that there's some big mystery that's hanging out back there relating to the Mayans, relating to the skull, and relating to the Atlanteans. Now, a lot of people have done great research around the crystal skull and Anna Mitchell Hedges and Mitchell Hedges and some of the things that went on there. And they've done great work. I don't intend to add to that here. What I want to do is put the skull in context of the ex-degonography that we've been observing through these mystery schools. And it seems to me that the skull comes right into the center of the picture when we are looking at this earlier battle that took place. Um, that is this weird echo. It's kind of X secret. That's the unspeakable, as it were. Um, so at HP, here's just a couple of shots of the HP lab. They're taking pictures of the skull. They're using pressure and sound to check it out. Um, they did a very thorough examination of it. And some of the things that they came up with uh, were quite fascinating. Let's see if I can read that. Um, let's try this one. Okay, this is something called the Dorland Manifestations of, they call it the phenomena. Friends, Frank Dorland and what happened. Frank Dorland, to whom Anna loaned the skull for many years, experienced visionary phenomena through the use of the skull. Uh, in particular, he was fascinated by its aura as well as the buildings seemingly from antiquity, which he saw displayed within its eye socket. And this is the thing, like pictures would show up for people when they were looking at this thing. A very different, new kind of technology. A visionary is not the only word for what its effects on him and others, since he heard what he takes to be the sound of faint, high metallic bells, chimes, and other noises, and noises apparently emanating from it. Dorland had also heard human voices softly singing strange chants. Dorland also claimed that the first time he kept the skull in his residence overnight, there was the sound of a prowling jungle cat within his home, as well as the ringing of chimes and bells. I'm going to go a little further with this. These occurred, let's see if we can see why some of these uh, effects happened. We're getting a little bit of a pothium uh, feeling from what he's describing. These effects occurred after Dorland entertained a most unusual visitor, Anton LaVey, the founder of San Francisco's Church of Satan. Now, <laughs> that was a curveball. I didn't see that one coming. LeVay, in the interest of publicity, had brought the editor of an Oakland paper claiming that the skull was the work of his deity and thus belonged to his church. To Dorland's uh, discomfort, LeVay did not leave in a hurry, having become ensconced at playing Dorland's organ. In addition to being Satan's representative on Earth, LeVay was also quite a good organist, apparently. Dorland had wanted to get the skull back into the vault, but found it had now become too late. After the Satanists had left, Dorland and his wife found a safe spot for the skull and went to bed, but not to a peaceable rest. All night long, there were lots and lots of sound, Dorland recounted, but explorations of the house at the time revealed nothing. When they got up the next morning, they found their belongings had been moved around. We had a telephone dialer that was made out of crystal that had been moved from the telephone at least 35 feet to the front door said Dorland, and it lay right across the front door threshold. I never believed that this poltergeist activity until it actually happened to me. Uh, Dorland attributes the phenomena to LeVay and the vibrations and so on. So moving down. Curiously, when Dorland and his wife found their belongings scattered around the house the following morning, there was no sign of outside intrusion, and the doors and windows were still locked. He's experienced other similar phenomena of <clears throat> with the crystal. Now, um, that is very strange, and what I see that as, obviously, groups like that would want to get their hands on the skull, and thank God that other groups weren't able to take it away before Anna Mitchell Hedges got it back. Um, so he uh, hooks up with a, an art restorer, and then they decide they can get HP to test it out. What HP found out is, is actually quite interesting, because um, they found that it was, in their opinion, the effect of many years of someone using something like a diamond to carve it out and that they didn't see any metal marks on the surface. Um, and in terms of the dating, of course, it's incredibly hard to date something that's just a solid piece of crystal like that. But um, I think that the general impression that they were getting is that the thing was at least over a thousand years old. Um, 
And the skull itself uh, producing the phenomena when people were in its general kind of um, presence, uh, it seems to me that when we go deeply into what Anna Mitchell Hedges was saying in terms of how they used it, that it was an incredibly powerful um, sacred object and that this is the, the nature of the thing, what happens when a sacred object meets the modern world. Of course, Anna Mitchell Hedges um, left it along the way with Bill Lo Homan and um, I, I think that, you know, it's once in a while he lets it out and he lets people come in and, and sort of observe it and feel it. And they do these from time to time. If you get a chance, <laughs> it seems to me one of those things you don't want to miss. Now let's go into what was happening in the background. Um, if we go back into the Mayans here, there is this whole thing about these skulls showing up on these altars and the communications taking place. Now, um, this is actually quite fascinating when we get deep into the mystery school tradition of what this means. And Steiner lets some particularly important things out in relation to this. Um, so I'm gonna encapsulate it real quickly in terms of what he is saying is going on during this period of the Maya developing into a civilization. Um, and then we're gonna see how, I'm gonna read a few quotes from him to see how this harmonic influences, influences that whole period. Um, so according to him, after the Atlantean destruction was brought on by incredibly advanced um, high-tech weaponry, which set off all these different things that happened in the earth, like volcanoes and cataclysms. Um, and in Casey's version, it's very similar, of course, to Steiner's version, along with Theosophy. They all three seem to agree uh, in, in to a staggering degree, actually, um, with very little variations. But basically, after this period, during the Atlantean period, there was a kind of a great spirit that they worshipped and had this incredible feeling for. And these followers of Amelius, um, they had these kind of incredible um, closeness to the spiritual realm. And they used the term Tao, which is very much like the Chinese Tao. Um, and what happened was the Aramon forces, seeing that the Atlanteans were coming back together and that the followers of Amelius were now in Yucatan and sort of getting a new advanced civilization going, um, that these forces were looking at them and saying, we have to throw them off somehow. So what they did, according to him, is they created kind of an artificial uh, character named uh, Tao Li. And the, um, it's sort of like a, an echo of this great sort of spiritual tradition that the Atlanteans had. And uh, it's Zamna is, is what comes out of this tradition eventually. It's, it's kind of menacing sky god person. But um, what was happening was they were creating this idea of doing the mysteries now instead of as a holy function, that they could get more and more holy, the more and more um, you know, strange cultures that they sacrificed to the gods. And this is where the whole human sacrifice thing was taking place. Now, there was a deep mystery uh, culture associated with this, a mystery death cult that came right out of the Aramonic mysteries, which Steiner touches on, and I'm going to get into. But before we go there, um, this kind of character of Atlantis that was happening, where the crystal skulls were part of the kind of force on the other side, preventing themselves from being influenced by these Aramonic priests and their death cult. There was a whole kind of warrior class that came out of that. Now, there's someone named A.E. who was George Russell who painted this picture of what Helena Blavatsky, who was the founder of Theosophy, actually looked like when he kind of looked at her past lives. And this is the picture that he drew. This is Blavatsky as that Atlantean warrior who was moving into this later culture in Yucatan and really kind of setting up the protection against this Aramonic death cult so that they didn't take these sacred mysteries and turn them this other way. Now, what's interesting is when we look at the case uh, of the information that came through Edgar Casey, he was somebody who was saying, look, 
What was happening in Atlantis was a war between two groups, these followers of Amelius and these sons of Belial and daughters of Belial. The sons and daughters of Belial were trying to use the same uh, crystal high-tech technology that was being used to interface with spiritual um, entities and use it for physical domination. So that's what the Belial group wanted and the other group wanted to keep it pure and said, we've got the technology and we're able to get the information and the direction from these higher sources. So they were using it as a, an interface, a communications device, and they would have the priestesses and the, um, you know, these groups that were set up in circles that would interface with these through the technology. Now, can you imagine, it would be the same thing of like taking something like uh, your laptop <laughs> and interfacing with a higher mind. This is the type of thing that was happening there in Atlantis. And the Belial group said, well, you know, that's great that you can interface with spiritual people, but we can take that and turn it into a laser and take over the other continents over there. So there was a whole split into what this was going to be used for, physical domination or spiritual attunement. And the uh, physical domination guys, the Belial guys won. Now that is the Aramonic uh, team there that we're talking about with Belial. So Casey's version of it is, he would call them the sons of Belial. In Steiner's work, he calls them Aramon. Um, and we've gone into Aramon and Belial in, in these shows in the past. So if you want to get a bigger feel for who these characters are, if you're just joining us, that's probably a good way to do it. If you're just joining us, uh, you're watching the Dark Journalist show. And of course, I'm joined by the ever acquisitive Olivia. How are we doing out there, Olivia? We're doing great. Um, everybody is really asking questions specifically about the crystal skull. It is quite fascinating. Um, interestingly enough, the, uh, the crystal skull, it seems to me, it's, it's one of those modern revelations. It's one of the things that slipped through the cracks that we actually got our hands on, you know, um, because Casey talks about in those ruins, when we look at that, that there are these emblems of the firestones of the two eye crystal which ran Atlantis, that are in the Mayan ruins. So when the crystal skull shows up, this is the thing that I, my mind immediately went to. Can I ask you a question right off? Oh, yeah. Because I think you're going to cover this in the episode. Um, Maustit uh, is asking, can DJ address the Paddler God's legend of the Maya and the correspondence of its Itzamna with Iltar of Atlantis? Well, it's interesting. I wonder, um, a lot of these legends get distorted. This is the, the fascinating thing, as we're going to see with one of the main ones that I bring up tonight. Um, and what, what happens is, during the course of the Mayan civilization, there's a great push-pull between those same forces that destroyed the Atlantean civilization, um, the Amelius followers and the followers of Belial. But it gets mutated. It's, an, it's like the next phase of it. And what happens is, Basically, uh, Iltar, who is someone who is one of the main characters in Atlantis, who's a follower of Amelius, and they're, you know, a benevolent spiritual race. He comes to Yucatan and founds a new community with only 10 people there, and basically, within 20 years, makes it into a new Atlantis. And he takes the records uh, that are the same records that are, this is Casey's version of the story. He takes the records that are in Atlantis about the history, uh, about the two-eye stone, all the information, and he hides it underneath a pyramid in the Yucatan. Well, the story, the corresponding story, is that these records are under the paw of the Sphinx. So people asked Edgar Casey, what's, you know, what's going on with, where are these records? And he said, there's three places where the records are kept. One was in Yucatan, one was basically where the Bimini Wall is, and that was called Poseidia at the time. So that one's sunken. The other one's in Yucatan, and the other one is... Uh, the entrance is under the Sphinx, but it's between the Sphinx and the river. So these are halls of records, and we've, we've covered these before, but the idea is that there are these Atlantean archives that are going to come to light, where we're going to understand just as a matter of course, the same way we developed and understood hieroglyphs and figured out what was going on there back in Egypt, we're going to understand the Atlantean aspect of it. But what's going on, and why this makes so much sense about the way we're tracking the ex-steganography, is groups like the Central Intelligence Agency 
you know, they're not just monitoring foreign governments or doing espionage and things like this. They have programs to find things like Noah's Ark or the Hall of Records. And you have to ask yourself, what's the point there? Well, they understand the significance of these archaeological wars and of these incredible um, archaeological finds and the artifacts that represent the soldier technology. They feel like there is a military objective one, but there's just a power dynamic in there, uh, the same way the Nazis were all about finding these objects. In truth, every major country has a program to recover these objects that relate to Atlantis. So when we think about what took place back there, we can see that a lot of it is hidden from us. I don't think that these groups uh, like the CIA know everything either, but I do feel like what they're all about is finding that out, getting there first and using that information. I absolutely feel that, you know, things like the, the kind of corporate state that we have now would absolutely use something like the two eye crystal to dominate the culture even further. I mean, look at them even with the basic technology that we have and the things that they're doing with it. Um, you know, I think the Theosophical Society was correct when they said, well, with the Keeley technology, the mystery schools shouldn't let it out because what's going to happen is the corporate raiders will come in, they'll rule the roost, and uh, what will take place is basically, you know, humankind will slide back three or four steps because we'll lose all that evolution because a tiny group will dominate the rest. And uh, this is the problem that we come up against over and over again. Okay, so yeah, that was a great question though. Thank you, Ms. L if you have another one, I'll take it too. Uh, okay, so David <laughs> Tormina is asking, uh, DJ, uh, what do you think of the Celestine prophecy and the supposed vanishing of the Maya? Wow, well, uh, Celestine prophecy was one of those books, it came out in 1993, I believe, and it had an incredible impact. Um, and it was kind of, it was interesting because I guess in some ways the author, uh, James Redfield, he continued to do stuff, but that was kind of, I guess, his, his real standout. And um, he put it in a way, it was kind of like an early Da Vinci Code in a mm -hmm. way, like, you know, it was kind of the commercial-ish version of all this stuff. Um, but uh, I, it made a huge impact, and I think that you can still find that book in people's bookshelves. Um, the other thing relating to the Maya and disappearing, there's no question that the Mayan development just stopped at a certain point, and there were no Roman emperors, you know, coming in and taking over the culture like in Egypt. We understand why it stopped. The Mayans, it's not very clear. And uh, I think it, you know, we get an idea from what I'm about to uh, speak on in relation to what Steiner said happened to the Mayans, um, which I think is pretty crucial, which is the direction that they were going in was becoming um, more and more degenerate and more and more along this Belial line. And uh, it got stopped. <laughs> so we're going to get into that. Of course, there were incredible high forces in the Maya. So when we say the Maya getting corrupted, you know, it's factions within that group. But Maya uh, in general, the Maya people brought us amazing things relating to astronomy and culture that mm -hmm. we still that don't is. understand. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, because, you know, the reason we don't understand is because our Christian missionaries burned all their books. So it's kind of hard to find history now that the books are gone. Um, but in any case, we have the esoteric tradition that can help us get there. Okay, let's take a look at some of these esoteric people. This is Rudolf Steiner, who I've referenced here. Um, and Steiner's work is very powerful, very underappreciated, I think, in this period. We're going to find out just how powerful it is. He was the leader of anthroposophy, uh, and he had started earlier with Annie Besant in theosophy. And Annie Besant took over the reins from Helena Blavatsky, who we just saw portrayed as that Atlantean warrior. Um, and really it's Blavatsky who started it all with the mystery schools coming out because they had decided, you know what, the things that we're doing um, with the spiritualist craze in America, trying to get people aware of spirituality, it's going wrong. We need to decide on a person that we can work through. And Blavatsky was kind of the trade-off choice because of her incredibly advanced um, atavistic medium uh, and psychic qualities. So she really could rise up in the way that the mystery traditions would have these um, kind of, I mean, you could call them kind of super magicians that existed 
back in this period that we're talking about Atlantis, and they could rise up out of their body into the spiritual world and come back. And this was the quality that Blavatsky apparently possessed that made her the obvious choice. And uh, she brought a, she brought a lot she brought a lot to us. Um, the figure, and I, I touch on this here. I show this when we get into these. This is the figure of Araman, which is, according to Steiner, the force that is trying to create a gigantic mechanized version of Earth where there's no soul, there's no spirit, and he wants to. Uh, basically move the human evolutionary track through something called, Steiner calls the Eighth Sphere. And uh, the Eighth Sphere was something that was adopted in Theosophy also. The Eighth Sphere basically surrounds the Earth, and it is a, a false domain of illusion, basically. And the idea is, in the esoteric tradition, when you die, you move into a reincarnation cycle, and you become advanced through many lifetimes and to, through going into these other realms and coming back. The Eighth Sphere is like an artificial half-step, and the, uh, the Eighth Sphere apparently is picking up um, prominence, if that is, it's becoming more solidified in this period. And what they, uh, people like Steiner and Blavatsky, see when they look out into the future, they see this gaining more momentum. So therefore, they make the, as the public mystery schools, they make the charge at a certain point, uh, especially Steiner after World War One. Forget it. I'm not hiding any more of our sessions anymore. Let all of my lectures out. That's why when you go into these bookstores, you're like, you know, Steiner is prolific. He wrote a lot of books, but he didn't write this many books. And it's all little um, sources of his lectures and things which were originally kept secret and they were only for the anthroposophical students. So we're actually lucky to have that stuff. But I think one of the things that um, Steiner pointed out in relation to this that was important was that he said, you know, basically anthroposophy and theosophy are failing here. And he said this in 1960, and the war had been going on since 1914. But he got it in his head that basically this attempt had failed at that particular time. But he identified a period, a hundred in 120 years in the future, which is 2016 to 2036. And this is, we're in the really early stretches of this now. And he said that the mystery school influence would rise again through anthroposophy and these movements so that they would have another chance at, at basically moving the culture through this work. So the question now is, is the culture ready to be moved through this work? And here we are. Uh, with a tremendous smart audience picking up on these things. And, you know, the ex steganography for me falls right into the middle of what the mystery schools were trying to keep us. Uh, basically, they were trying to give us this message. You know, it was that there are higher things, you can discover them. And it's not that they're going to be kind of the main headline, you know. <laughs> uh, I suppose Atlantis discovered would move the culture pretty fast. But these things are, are there. These people have made the sacrifices to come forward and give us these gifts. So um, whether it's the information that, you know, Olivia and I were walking around seeing these people carrying their mm -hmm. uh, yoga uh, clothes and their yoga mats and stuff. And think, you know, that's theosophy. I mean, it's really this influence, this Eastern influence that came out that we can celebrate. And on the other hand, um, meditation, you know, all these different things, they are now part of the culture. Okay, now can we go to the next step, which is a lot of people, when they look at this period of time, they say, oh, well, there were some spiritual groups that rose up in the 19, early 19th century, late, uh, you know, into the 20th century. And like, they basically, you know, they went the way of the dinosaur but in, in actual fact, what happens with mystery schools and why this doesn't kind of play into the regular institutional wave of how things happen, with mystery schools, they come out, they spread seeds, and they see what develops. And then they get an opportunity to move back in and support what happens. Um, that's a better way to look at them because the powerful impact of, uh, you know, whether it's any Besant in India with home rule, or it's the Varian brothers, uh, you know, they've, they have this dramatic impact. And uh, that impact is happening now, which is why we're talking about it. Okay, so we've gone over the X there. Did you have anything else, Olivia? Uh, that's it for now. Okay, good. But I hope you leave a lot of time for questions at the end. <laughs> we're going to do our best. Um, but of course, we might have a show that we're just two questions in because it's, it's going to be that kind of a thing. 
this character, um, Vitzli Putzli is the name. How do you like that, Olivia? That sounded great. Vitzli Putzli, I got it. I practiced this earlier because it's one of those little unusual phrases. Very unusual figure um, that Steiner identifies for us. And I think that um, what we have to say about what he's trying to tell us in relation to it about the Mayan mysteries, I'm going to quote him here so we get an idea of what was going on. So basically, the Atlantean continent goes down an incredible cataclysm because the Belial group has used the Two-Eye Stone to dominate these other cultures. And while they're doing it, they basically, it's like a nuclear disaster. But in this case, it's the stone forces were accidentally set too high and they bring, the, first they split Atlantis into three islands and then they bring it down. So um, that kind of domination didn't play out too well. So these groups um, like Iltar move and they are followers of what Casey calls Amelius. They move to the Yucatan, one of the major, I mean, they moved to Egypt also, but we're gonna focus here on the Americas. They move to Yucatan and they start basically a new version of Atlantis without all the incredible distortions of the Belial group. So um, the Armonic forces, remember, whose goal in this esoteric tradition is to move mankind into this false eighth sphere, felt like they were doing pretty well with the Belial group almost destroying the earth. Um, so they want to get some of that power back. So what they do is they start to move into the Mayan culture. And I've showed you um, one of the sky gods that they introduced there. And so they're getting into this tradition where they're saying, you can get to this incredible um, realization, this initiation, this higher knowledge, this higher mind by doing these sacrifices. And um, so they're moving them into this kind of occult, um, this kind of harmonic death cult. It's the best way for us to put it. The buffer against this is Vitzli Putzli and the, um, the Steiner information on it, I think, really says a lot. Let's take a quick look at him and what he did. Uh, here he is, and he is basically on top of the eighth sphere, and he's driven a couple of stakes through the eighth sphere here. He's sitting on, it's hard, this is hard to actually see, but he's sitting on an X throne, and he's got the shield against Araman there. And oddly enough, he, he almost looks like he's in some kind of like Roman or Greco-Roman <laughs> Set up. Uh, I do feel like this is quite remarkable uh, when we look at this character and this figure. Very little known in history, um, very underreported and underrepresented. But we're going to tell you what he did and why he's on top of the eighth sphere here. Um, there's this is the same period of time that he's in when this is taking place, which is the crucifixion, and this is the archangel coming down here to earth. Um, this, these incredible things were taking place. And um, the idea is that during this period when Christ is on earth, we have this huge switchover going up. We always pay attention to what's happening in the Middle East. Well, apparently there's some kind of a mirror operation happening in the Americas and all across the world. But the Americas part, I think, is particularly interesting because we get so much from these different religions like the Mormons and people talking about, well, the 12 tribes, you know, one of the tribes, the lost tribes came here to America and that's a deep part of their uh, religion. But I find when I look at the mystery schools, there's a lot of support for um, that basic setup story around the Mormon history. Um, so I, that, that kind of uh, is interesting, get into it. Okay, um, so a few quick quotes about Vitzla Putli. This is Steiner, and it's in something uh, called Steiner and the Mexican Mysteries, which is a lecture that he gave, and um, it's part of the Inner Impulses series. I believe it's number four, if that helps you out. But there, there are books and uh, recordings of it. Uh, unfortunately, they're voiceover recordings. There are no good recordings of Steiner's voice, not that I've heard anyway, but I, I would love to get my hands on that. And remember, he's writing everything in German and it's being translated. Okay, just a quick uh, snapshot of this Witzle Putzli character. A movement developed in these regions. Uh, counter movements were necessary in the fifth post Atlantean epoch. So, as we're getting out of this kind of um, Greco Roman period. So, a 
Further counter movement developed as a result of the birth of a being who lived in a physical body in contrast to those beings who manifested only in etheric bodies. So a lot of these kind of spiritual characters exist on the etheric plane. And once in a while we get a physical manifestation. Um, you know, Buddha would be a physical manifestation. And Christ is a whole, you know, different category. He is a, an archangel manifested in, in physical life. Okay. Um, so we're going into this. The name given to the being may be expressed by a combination of syllables that approximate Vitzli Putzli. Um, it's V I T Z L I P U T Z L I. And we're going to get deep into this. Vitzli Putzli was a human being, a being who appeared in a physical body. In Vitzli Putzli, the spiritual individu individuality lived, who within a human body took up the fight against the mysteries I've been describing. Those mysteries are the harmonic death cult um, mysteries. And um, I, I'll give just a quick description of those. They're a little bit gruesome, but we know that this culture and the Aztecs who followed them had this gruesome aspect to it. So I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but just to give us kind of a basic outline of it. Um, in speaking of these, uh, this is Steiner now, when we speak of the attacks of Luciferic and harmonic powers, such things as these are here indicated uh, were prepared long beforehand. So um, this is relating to that. They're actually setting up this period of time, working around the time of Christ. They're trying to project 2,000 years in the future to when they can take over, basically. So their plan was to bring all human faculties and human forces of will under the sway of a longing to be alienated from the earth, kind of an anti-earth transhumanist movement, to leave the earth and build up a separate planetary body, the eighth sphere, while the earth was to be deserted and left desolate. So um, here's that theme again of these harmonic Luciferian powers moving, trying to move on humanity to get them to think of the earth as something negative and to move them into this realm of illusion and fantasy and then capture them in the eighth sphere. That's the esoteric tradition that Steiner spent three decades trying to get that across to us. That the harmonic figure here this, uh, that's Steiner's sculpture of this vision of Armand that he had. Um, this figure is trying to move humanity into the eighth sphere where it has total dominion. And the way that it can do that really is through this kind of fantasy operation where we see things as they aren't really. And um, where we solidify in that, it's very much like um, the Matrix. If you remember that whole scene about they think they're running around doing all these things, and then you look at them really and they're just plugged into these power sockets. Um, now, before we get into that, actually, I want to make a point that I left dangling in the last episode about the Matrix. And um, one quick thing, thank God there was someone who pointed this out to me, which is that the keyboard stroke that Neo hits in the Matrix movie is the X in the keyboard, and then it says, follow the white rabbit, uh, of course. And we're taking the white rabbit back from all those crazy groups out there are trying to use it. Um, this is the X that he presses in the movie. And we pointed out, uh, and I think it has to be, it can never stop being pointed out that the whole red pill, blue pill exercise that takes place in the matrix with Morpheus and Neo is directly, and I mean directly out of Steiner's uh, work on the revelation, which he sees this whole uh, thing between the blue vein and the red blood and the oxygen as relating to this. And I'm gonna read that little piece before we go further. Um, this is the, uh, this is the Steiner lecture on the apocalypse. It's about the fourth uh, key of Re Revelation. And that's the red pill er as it were, and the blue pill er red pill, blue pill. The, um, the red pill is when we get to see ourselves uh, in humanity as this force. We have the awareness and all the rest of it. That's the oxygen and the red blood. And the blue pill is the lowered vision, not seeing the full spiritual picture. It represents the vein through which the blood flows. Very different kind of a thing. Um, quite fascinating, though, I have to say. 
And here's Steiner's quote on it, which I for neglected to read yesterday. You're going to get it now. How did the human being become a knower? The answer is connected with the inhalation of air through the lungs, where the used blue blood is transformed into red blood. In this way, the human being could take up the odum, the breath of God, that is the becoming of the individual human eye through the inflowing of God, through which the human being becomes a knowing soul. Moving down, the oxygen that is so necessary to create red blood uh, takes the oxygen from the air so that human beings can take into themselves the tree of knowledge through the red blood. This is a very significant lecture from Steiner. The other tree, the tree of blue veins, has been taken away from the human being in terms of human mastery over it. It contains the used blue blood, which is a poison filled with death. Before the human being descended from the bosom of God, it was the tree of life. By becoming earthly, the human being is divided into two parts, comprising the venial and the arterial, the blue and the red blood vessel systems. The blue blood streams up to the heart and must unite with what plants give. The human being breathes out carbon dioxide. So we're getting the idea here. He's explaining a very deep esoteric principle on that red pill, blue pill or <laughs> setup. Um, and I think the, the last thing I would say on that is um, that he says, the alchemy of the human being is this. What the plants do for us today, human beings in the future will be able to accomplish within and through their own consciousness. What is outside the human being today will be intertwined within the physical body when we've taken the entire plant world, when we have expanded our consciousness to include the world of plants, that is the future condition of humanity, then what exists in the natural world surrounding us will be entirely different. Our entire cosmos will be changed with us. Earlier conditions will return at a higher level. Um, what he's trying to get into, and he's, he's getting into the... Um, physical aspects as well. But it's basically this, the blue pill, red pill revelation is the blue pillar and red pillar image that comes about when he's looking at this seventh seal of the revelation. Uh, the fourth seal, I'm sorry. There are seven. There there happens to be um, a, a kind of a, a process that takes place when we're on earth where our consciousness dulls naturally so that when you're looking at it from the esoteric angle and in that tradition you're seeing that people fall for comfort they fall for identification they fall for all these different things political movements whatever it happens to be and in that process um, we lose our, our basic spiritual evolution and that the spiritual evolution uh, being the red pillar in, in this case is what is kind of our birthright. So therefore, anything else is interference. So the armonic powers and this whole kind of wave of technology that we're in now is very similar to what took place in Atlantis. And the last time around, what took place is that humanity became like gods when they used the technology to almost undo themselves physically and spiritually. So groups like Araman have the ability to work on humanity to keep them in this kind of illusionary state. And that's what we call, you know, kind of materialism. And that's what the mystery schools were dealing with in 1840 when they made this decision to let so much of the secret information out. They're looking at the same situation and saying, you know what, we're not gonna recognize humanity in a hundred years. So we have to let this out no matter what happens. And so that's why we have this information. And that's why we need to make sense of it because the influx of scientific materialism through the technology is going to create this transhumanist problem and that's going to make uh, our soul and spiritual bodies vulnerable to this eighth sphere scenario of moving into this fantasy realm instead of progressing uh, through a true path of spiritual evolution. That is the kind of crux of the work of Steiner around Araman, which is to get people to be aware of who and what it is. Uh, I think that's a good way to put it. I almost said he is, but I guess that's <laughs> that would be a sexist way to, to look at it. Um, okay, so now let's just take a look at the technology that existed in Atlantis. I'm going to try to do this in a capsule form and then wrap it all around to how the mysteries were used and how the crystal skull was used to get us out of this um, kind of jam that we got ourselves into in that Mayan period. So this is Casey's quote uh, talking about Iltar going from Atlantis, which was sinking, 
to Yucatan to set up the new Atlantis there. So uh, what he says is, together with the leavings of the civilization Atlantis in Poseidia, more specific, Poseidia is the big island that controls Atlantis, and that's off the coast of Florida, so like Cuba and Bimini and all that. It's right in that area where we see a lot of, of ruins and a lot of rumors of ruins. Uh, Iltar, with a group of followers who had been up the household of Atlan, and their followers and, and the worship that they have is of one, so it's this Amelius group I've been referring to, with 10 individuals left Poseidia and came westward, entering into what we would now call a portion of the Yucatan, and there began with the activities of the peoples, the development into a civilization that rose much in the same manner as that which had been in the Atlantean land. They created another version of Atlantis, a kind of small condensed version of it in the Yucatan. Um, so he goes into it and he talks about the temples that they erect and the things that they do. But what he talks about here is that they have this tradition of the fire stone. Now, um, the two eye stone is the incredible crystal that he described, which ran these power systems. So it ran the airships that we had in the period. It ran the technology. It was the power system, it was the free energy system, in essence. And that was the thing that got used. So um, when he's describing it, it seems like they're talking about these smaller, more portable versions of that. It's kind of like the size of an iPhone that is referred to as a Firestone. And that the Firestones are something that they still use in this period, post the Atlantean um, debacle where they're using it to interface with these spiritual groups. So there are spiritual entities in the outer sphere, as he refers to it here, and they're using these firestones to communicate with them. That's where they're getting this higher knowledge from. Somehow there's a physical process of using these crystals to interface with these higher beings. Okay, the first temples that were erected by Iltar and his followers were destroyed at that period. Of that now being found and a portion already discovered that is laid in waste for many centuries was then a combination of those peoples from Mu, Oz, and Atlantis. And Oz is a very odd uh, thing, but it's a land that was uh, a culture that was in South America. So there's a lot of upheavals, a lot of egress, a lot of people going from culture to culture. So what happened to Iltar and this group since his temples got destroyed? Those in the Yucatan, those in the adjoining lands that were begun by Iltar, the new Atlantis people, gradually lost in their activities and came to be what most people termed in other portions of America, the mound builders. So they get out of the Yucatan because they're being overwhelmed by these new harmonic death cult groups. The entity was among those of the second generation of Atlanteans who struggled northward from Yucatan, settling into what is now a portion of Kentucky, Ohio, and Indiana, being among those in the earlier period known as the Mound Builders. There's no question that link from the Atlantis group of Iltar to the Mound Builders. And of course, the Mound Builders, it's incredibly sophisticated designs. Uh, we get so much from that. So um, the Firestones, let's just touch on what they are. The stones that are circular, that were of the magnetized influence upon which the spirit of the one spoke to those people as they gathered in their service are of the earliest Atlantean activities and religious service we would call today. The records and manners of construction of same, the Firestone Crystal, are in three places in the earth as it stands today. In the temple records that were in Egypt, when the entity later acted in cooperation with others in preserving the records that came from the land where these had been kept. So we've talked about the three places where they are. So what is he saying here? We've got the Atlantean crystal now has been used to split up the continent. The people had to flee. The groups that were following Amelius are kind of the more spiritual groups using the spiritual technology. They still have the technology and they're kind of moving into this area. And then over time, after they build up even a new culture in the Yucatan that's like Atlantis, this thing happens again, where these harmonic uh, Belial groups get the upper hand by using the technology in a more uh, you know, dominant fashion. So what he's saying is they have to keep moving. This is where the mystery school tradition comes from, you know, the mound builders. They're, they're moving it underground. They're getting away from the es exoteric and moving it esoteric. They're moving it behind the scenes. And the cultures that are on the surface are trying to take over and they're, they're moving out again, the followers of Amelius. So um, the actual crystal, I think, is worth 
us kind of getting our heads wrapped around it. So I'm just going to read a brief description. They asked him, basically, can you describe what the two-eye stone, the terrible crystal, looked like? What, you know, how did it function? So what he says is, in the center of a building of what today would be said to have been lined with non-conductive metals or non-conductive stone, something akin to asbestos, the building above the stone was oval or a dome, wherein there could be or was the rolling back so that the activity of the stone was receiving the sun's rays or from the stars, the concentrating of the energies that emanate from the bodies that are on fire themselves with the elements that are found and are not found in the earth's atmosphere. The concentration through the prisms of glass as would be called in the present was in such a manner that it acted upon the instruments that were connected with the various modes of travel through induction methods that made much the character of control or remote control through radio vibrations or directions would be in the present day, though the manner of force that was impelled from the stone acted upon the motivating forces in the crafts themselves. They're more interlocked with the technology directly. You know, for us, it's an external thing. Somehow they're, they're right in the heart of it. Um, so he says the way it was worked, they roll the dome back and then they would have these stars or the sun motivate through it that would lift the craft up that would kept the entire culture uh, heated it was the energy system and all the rest of it so that same process however was used to communicate with these higher spiritual beings and this was the the basic lock between these um, followers of Belial and the followers of Amelius and, and the followers of one so um, he's saying not intentionally, the crystal was set too high and brought the second period of destructive forces to the peoples in the land and broke up the land into the isles that later became the periods through which destructive forces were brought to the land. And uh, hence, the body rejuvenated itself often and remained in that land until the eventual destruction, joining with the peoples that made for the breaking up of the land or joining with Belial. So Belial is what he's calling this group. Uh, and it's the same group that uh, Steiner is calling the Aramonic forces. By the time they get into the Mayan culture, they're the, the Aramonic death cult. Their whole thing is about we need to do sacrifice in order to get anywhere. Um, so they rule uh, through a kind of a, a terror of domination. So it gives us an idea. Now, Steiner's looking back at this period and he's saying, well, you know, this is how that group advanced, you know, this evil harmonic death cult. They would get what happened in the Atlantis mysteries is they would attune through the crystal and get the information that way. These guys do human sacrifice. That's how they get it. So it's coming from a completely different source and it gives us an idea of what the harmonic powers are all about. Um, now, before I read the Steiner Mayan mysteries quote, Olivia, how are we doing with everybody? We're doing great. Excellent. I already have too many questions. <laughs> uh, it's great to have so many people here. Uh, we have over a thousand people in the chat. That's fantastic. And um, you're watching Dark Journalist. We're going deep into the Mayan mysteries. And we started through the figure of the crystal skull. We're going to bring it around to that before we end up here. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit more of this. And then we're going to go to your questions in the second half. Keep the questions in caps. That's the best way for Olivia to track because those questions are going by so fast. And uh, it's great to have so many of you out there. Um, okay, so we now go to what they set up um, with this figure of Tautli, who we've, we've showed before. And um, this is what Steiner calls the Tautli mysteries. And this is, there's an echo in the Atlantean groups after the destruction. They're still kind of have a memory of this uh, Tao figure, and it's basically this higher spirit. And the Tautle mysteries are this imitation thing that Arman creates to give them that same feeling, but lead them this different way towards this uh, Armonic death cult. So um, in a nutshell, he was saying that during the period of um, when, when they tried, when Arman tried to influence the Greeks and all the rest of it, he was injecting a lot of fantasy into it. And what happened is far from, they kind of got the opposite effect going um, where, you know, people were starting to enjoy their lives. They didn't have a negative attitude of earth and they weren't interested in moving into this eighth uh, sphere. They didn't need it because they were having a good enough time on earth. So um, 
he's saying that these harmonic powers wanted to lead away the souls of men so that the bodies still to be born on the earth would have gone about without egos. This is very interesting, actually, because that way they can enter into it if the person doesn't have their own ego. And the souls would have departed to a special planet of their own, the eighth sphere. That's that's basically the setup that we find in Steiner's work over and over again. You look at three decades of work, and I can tell you what it essentially comes down to. Yes, there's Eurythmy. Yes, there's biodynamic farming. Uh, yes, there's Waldorf schools and all the rest of it. But it's essentially that Armon uh, and the harmonic forces are trying to steer man, uh, kind, and humanity into the eighth sphere, which is an artificial and um, dangerous evolutionary track um, where they rule the roost, basically, even more than they would on Earth. So this is basically his 100% thesis on this. Um, so they create this character, um, the harmonic forces in the Mayan period. And he calls him the great black magician. And he is the most powerful black magician that's ever been on earth. And he's dominating the culture and turning them into this harmonic force. And the mysteries that they're doing are take on the kind of Luciferian satanic quality, just the opposite of the higher spiritual quality that Iltar and the Emilius followers from Atlantis have. So, um, what he says is, he calls Lucifer and Armon retarded spirits, which I think is interesting. But what he says is that they not to be underestimated, and we can't judge them from the human standpoint what is to be observed in the spiritual world. If we do so, we should soon be considering ourselves much cleverer than a god or a being belonging to some higher hierarchical order. So um, what he's saying basically here is they belong to this higher order, even though they're... Uh, malevolent, so that we can't really underestimate them or try to kind of um, peer too much into their motivations. It's hard for us because they're on an entirely different level. So he says, although Arman and Lucifer are retarded spirits, they belong to a hierarchical order higher than that of man. It is therefore understandable that they are repeatedly disillusioned, but their strivings always begin anew. So the game is always on with them. They're always going to be trying to find these ways while we're in this evolutionary process to dominate humanity. So Vizsla Putli is this, um, he's kind of the savior version, the same way that Christ is happening over there in Jerusalem. Vizsla Putli is acting in a similar mirror fashion over here in the Yucatan. And what's happening with the Mayan culture is they're being dominated by these harmonic uh, death cult priests. And the whole culture is going down. And so what they decide to do is have this character come in. Now, Vitz the Putli, according to legend, doesn't uh, is born of a virgin birth. So he, you know, he really is following in the footsteps of Christ here, which I find quite fascinating. So back to Steiner now. Um, and this is Steiner on the Mayan Mysteries. Hence, in the West, the more harmonic side of the outlived Atlantean mystery culture was promulgated. This led to the establishment of mysteries that inevitably make a most repulsive impression upon those that have grown up in the tender culture of modern times and do not like to hear the truth, but only blessedness, as it is often called. These post-Atlantean mysteries developed especially on the soil of Mexico. Mysteries were established there, but they were spread over a large part of the America, and the Europeans had not even yet discovered. If their impulses and workings had been victorious, and this is always a key point to pay attention to, if they had been victorious, these mysteries would have driven souls away from the earth. By this means, the service performed by Arama, what he calls the squeezing out of the lemons, would have become effective. The earth would gradually have become desolate, having only upon it the forces of death, whereas any living souls would have departed to found another planet under the leadership of Lucifer and Arma. That's the eighth sphere. In order to execute the Armonic part of the task, it was necessary for the priests of these Armonic Atlantean mysteries to acquire faculties possessing the highest degrees of control and mastery over all forces of death in earthly working. This is how they were training them in the mysteries. These forces would have made the earth, together with physical man, 
for the souls were to depart into a purely mechanistic realm. Remember, this is what he's saying the goal of the eighth sphere and the harmonic forces are. So this is when we find these priests that are, you know, doing these blood sacrifices and pulling out these hearts and stuff. They're part of this group. Uh, this is their goal. Um, <clears throat> it would turn the earth into a great dead realm in which no ego could have a place. These faculties would have to be connected also with mastery of the mechanistic element in everything living, for mechanistic elements in all life. For this reason, these mysteries had to be instituted in a truly devilish form because such forces as would have been needed for the powerful aims of Araman could only arise when initiations of a special kind are attained. So um, we can see that when we talk about these groups that arose, and we always hear these legends of the different elites sacrificing and using human sacrifice and all the rest of it, that the roots of it that we're looking at and the... Um, the groups that we think about, you know, um, that would perform these things when we hear about it, this is an echo of what Araman was doing. And remember, they were doing it on the North American continent, which is very, I think, significant because that North America, Central America, South America, this line they knew was going to be crucial in the future and was going to be the leading edge. And they wanted to get that foothold in there. And so what happens is um, this Vitzli Putle becomes the kind of buffer against that whole aromatic movement. And in Steiner's work, um, he sets up a number of these initiates to battle against this force. And they succeed. In fact, they succeed by crucifying the black magician in the same period that Christ is crucified. Uh, crucified. And um, when we think about that, it's kind of like the mirror image of that, because in Christ's crucifixion, we have all these incredible esoteric ramifications taking place, including Araman's dominion over Earth evolution being moved back, um, and all the things associated with resurrection and all the rest of it. But it, it represents a change. It's an impulse that changes the entire evolutionary track of humanity. What's fascinating about it is on the other side of the world, this event is taking place where Araman has set up this master magician to just dominate the entire continent of America. And uh, it is only through this unusual figure of Vitzli Putli that things get turned around. Now, um, I think that, uh, you know, there, there, there's a lot to this, and I, you know, we can't really cover it in one show, but this whole tradition, this whole battle coming out, and when we get to something like the Crystal Skull in the Mayan tradition, we start to understand that the initiates that were working with these higher mysteries that came out of Atlantis, they have the ability to see the future, and they know that if, very much like the Revolutionary War, that if they don't take this on now and defeat it, that the entire future hangs in the balance. So this is what you know they were looking at in terms of the kinds of priests that they had. They were fighting a spiritual war, and you know we might see things on the surface and say, well, you know the Aztecs had so many people and the Mayans had so many people and so many tribes were doing warfare, but on the spiritual side, it's a completely different kind of warfare that's taking place. And so something like the Crystal Skull. Um, which contains the information from Atlantis that's transferred down through generations becomes, you know, you know, it's no wonder that when they found it, that the entire group that they were working doing excavations with decided to stop for three days and not do anything. And uh, Hedges was like, "Oh, I don't know what's going on here. We better give them the skull." And uh, in the story of Mitchell Hedges and the Crystal Skull, the way that Anna tells it is that they give the group of workers, the skull, and three days later they give it back and say, no, that it's supposed to be with you. So that whole process reassures them that they're meant to bring it to America. And um, I do find it quite fascinating because um, there has to be maybe only, uh, you know, a half dozen relics or so in the public domain that have that kind of an impact. And the way that I would look at it is it's something that we 
not only are very lucky to have, but it really feels like, you know, it has that importance for our time. That it's an echo of this battle that took place between the Aramonic death cult and those higher Amelius followers that came out of the Atlantean period. We're looking at that clash and it moves through time. And here we are 2000 years later and facing down the large transhumanist forces. And we're looking at it and we're saying to ourselves, you know, what's the upshot of this? Where are we going to move to? And we've got that echo and even some of the relics from the previous battle. Mm -hmm. So the crystal skull, I think, takes on a very significant um, place in all of this. And with that, I am going to turn it mm -hmm. over to Miss Olivia. Okay. All right. So the first question is from the observer. Did she find the skull or did the skull find her? <laughs> That's a great question. It is great. I think that the, um, look, it's odd. She was in another country and she had an unusual setup where, where she became, uh, you know, living with family in Canada. And it just so happened that Mitchell Hedges and his wife were there and decided to adopt her because she was basically becoming an orphan. Um, it's an unusual history and then they take her everywhere. My feeling on it is there's something kind of Orphic Circle-ish about all this. One thing I forgot to mention is that in fact, um, she said that Augustus Lee Plongeon and Mitchell Hedges met. And it's interesting because one of the things, the tradition that they were talking about was about how there were these skulls that were terrorizing the populace down there in Mexico and that they were flying skulls that were translucent. Sounds like a crystal skull, but it would fly around. <laughs> um, so he may have ignited in his imagination the search for the crystal skull. So the way that it's discovered, I think, is always interesting. And one of the things that Mitchell Hedges says in his own autobiography is the way it was discovered is something I can never reveal. So we know Anna Mitchell Hedges' story of finding it on her birthday, and um, it sounds it sounds perfectly legit, but apparently there's something more to it. Plan B is asking, if these mystery school types were so powerful, why did they die off? Uh, they didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, the mystery schools are very active, and they, they work, they come into the public sphere, like when the Rosicrucians showed up in the Middle Ages. Um, and when you know they ignite things like um, alchemy and uh, the hermetic kind of movements that we see. And um, I do feel like um, they move in, the, in their own timing. So it's very hard to see how they're operating physically on a regular timeline. But we can see with theosophy, we can see with anthroposophy and the things that happened at the end of the 19th century into the early 20th century, they've set us up you know, they've given us the gifts of understanding the transhumanism, uh, what's happening with that. And they've given us tools um, like meditation, like knowledge of psychic abilities um, and so on, that I think it gets us into a totally, you know, we start to understand, oh, they are still with us. They are operating all the time there behind the scenes. And like I said, you know, mystery doesn't mean good or bad. Mystery means mystery. They're a hidden school, but you can be sure for every evil, uh, operation there are or you know at least selfish operation there's certainly um highly minded highly idealized mystery schools operating okay jam with jambo uh dj is there a messianic counterpart to araman in the steiner cosmology well it's interesting i mean um i mean part, it would be christ wouldn't it yeah the um there is a, a way to look at this which is on the opposite end of the spectrum is, um, you know, because it's weird because the harmonic forces can use a version of Christ. Like if, if people were to say, well, you know, um, in a very repressive kind of religious way, if they were like, uh, if there was an ultra conservative sect that was teaching Christ, that's very harmonic using the Christian name. So it's, it's a tricky thing. I think the harmonic thing is like a force and then you have the spiritual Great White Brotherhood is on the other side. And the Great White Brotherhood is, um, you know, high figures like Christ, um, like Elijah, 
all of these figures, Saint Germain, and they operate because they've they've taken off uh, from Earth. They've learned the lessons of Earth, and now they're on this higher level, and they're looking at humanity going through the circle, and they're there operating. But the truth is, the way that the evolutionary curve works, Aramon is on one side, and the White Brotherhood is on the other, and we, from our own efforts, gravitate to one side or we gravitate to the other. Now, you can see it just like when there's great, uh, you know, war cries and things like that, or people say bomb Iran or something. I mean, that's a pretty harmonic thing. They want to lead us down into this hole. We all remember the terror decade. Um, that's why we talk so much about the deep state and things on this program, because that force is there. It's moving and it's trying to control humanity. I mean, when you think about um, the technological control in the 21st century or the technological advancement that we can have on the positive side, it's a toss up. Okay, our favorite, bend over. Um, looks like the Aramonic groups have been kicking butt all along. The other group just looks like a giant wuss and keeps losing. What do you have to say to that? No, it's the opposite actually because Armand thought they were taken over during the Greek period, and instead, this uh, the thing that they were laying on, according to uh, Steiner, that they got they it backfired. Basically, they made people through their fantasy life enjoy Earth so much that this idea of going into the eighth sphere didn't happen. Um, no, the forces that swoop in, just like with the Mexican mysteries, um, and with the fact that they had kind of turned this right of sacrificing to a higher will. Um, you know, in the Christian sense, it would be like, you know, thy will be done. Um, so they were turning that into, I'm going to advance and offer up human sacrifice to the gods. That's a very different kind of a curve. Um, but I do feel like what it is about the harmonic thing is it's it's always dangerous. It's, it's a dangerous, it's an ongoing dangerous. And the problem from Steiner's perspective is that modern culture at that period of time, when he's talking 1920, um, they're not aware of it. And so that's that's the great danger. So that when Aramon becomes a full on physical incarnation, you know, we've theorized he might incarnate through an android or something, um, that human humanity would just have no way of dealing with it because it doesn't have the knowledge background around it. So he laid a great emphasis in over three decades of research around learning about what Aramon is. Not as like a, a fear porn thing, you know. But he, I think he felt that um, in theosophy, they were painting such a rosy picture of humanity's future that, you know, we're moving into the sixth race and we're all, everyone's going to be psychic and, you know, it's going to be a huge kind of everyone sharing with everyone situation. That sounds great. Problem is, in the meantime, there's a real chance that Armand would swoop in, dominate the culture and move them all off into a false evolutionary step. This is the battle... This is the battle that the mystery schools are have been fighting under the, behind the scenes. So you know we brought it, we brought the X in, we brought the steganography in to track something that started off as a technological program that was hidden, and now we see it hidden all the way back to the origins of humanity in Atlantis. It tells us that I would say we're on the right track. Anyway. Imagine this is asking: Do you think the New Earth followers are being tricked into belief in the Eighth Sphere? and leaving the natural life-giving energy of the earth behind. Yeah, I, that's the idea, exactly. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, and it's a weird thing because, you know, um, when this came up, I think Dolores Cannon talked a lot about this, where it was going to be like the new earth would split off and everybody bad would be left behind. <laughs> There's a deep, deep, deep esoteric conversation that happens and it works like this that we evolve at a certain point we move through the earth to do that and then uh, in Steiner's work we move into a new Jupiter that's the next step in evolution and the group that does not evolve uh, they they move off into a different direction that's just you know earth is the kind of the battleground for that that's where the theme of the new earth comes from but then this other thing comes up through this work and it's like we're moving into a different dimension and all these people over here get to leave behind the bad earth here um you know 
<laughs> uh, unfortunately, nobody's advanced enough to be able to do that and leave it behind. I mean, there might be a few people, but certainly not the whole culture. You know, I mean, we still have a culture that's steeped in Family Guy. We're going to have to fix that first of all. <laughs> Uh, David Ward, uh, do you think that people are being moved into the East sphere right now, that this is already happening on an individual level? Oh, the eighth sphere is always getting new recruits. There's no question about it. I mean, if you follow the work the way that it's laid out, and we're lucky to have the information about the eighth sphere, according to Steiner, it you know, it's let out by AP Senate, and it was not supposed to have been let out. This is one of those secrets that was not supposed to be in the public domain. So we're lucky to have it, and we're lucky to have Steiner's input on it, because the idea that we're being moved into a false virtual reality, you know, Olivia and I were, were trying to work this out between ourselves, and we said, you know, what would be a real representative of the eighth sphere, just in simple terms? And we were talking about people interfacing so much through a screen. Now, don't get me wrong, I understand the benefits of the technology and I love the communications because I think it does heighten our ability to work with each other and to have that closer kind of interaction. But the truth is we are in a situation where we're interfacing more with the screens than with the people around us. And so if that is some kind of projection or an early warning system uh, for moving into the eighth sphere, I think that we it is something that you do have to be very careful with. And of course, um, awareness, personal awareness, will prevent that eighth sphere thing from happening. But we see a lot of people going into the eighth sphere, drained of the eighth sphere over and over again. Leilani G is asking, is there any escape from the eighth sphere? And M. Leland, uh, DJ, can we humans rid the earth of the eighth sphere? Can we destroy it? Well, it's interesting. That makes me think of the Gurdjieff work. <laughs> These are great questions. Uh, the Gurdjieff work says that on Earth, you're under so many laws naturally. I think there were 96. And that the higher your awareness goes, you the laws come strip off you, basically. You're not under this law. You're not under the law of automatic action, of mechanistic action. Um, you know, we've talked about how in some cultures, there's that idea that the higher groups teach that says the, the what to do is always out there and the how to do it is always hidden because the how to do it is always persecuted and driven underground. So, you know, the classic example is turn the other cheek. It's tricky because you need a process to learn how to do that, right? It, and so that method of how to turn the other cheek is um, so we have the concept is right. We have that out there. That's the exoteric part. But the esoteric part, which is how to do it, is hidden, and you have to go look for that. So it is kind of fascinating, I would say. Um, in terms of how do you get out of the eighth sphere, look, a good example would be drug addiction. We see people with drug addiction over and over again. The trick is, yes, can people get out of drug addiction? Absolutely. But at the same time, their will has to overcome the will of the drug that's working on them. So I think that the eighth sphere has a lot of counterparts in traditional everyday life that we can point to. So it's not a sci-fi concept by any stretch of the imagination. I think it's something that we see on a regular basis. Okay. Mythmaker is asking, can, um, has Daniel read the Popol Vuh or Popol Vuh? Popol Vuh. And what do you think about gods that can be carried in backpacks? <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Um, my God, I'm, we're going to have to do a show just dedicated to the Mayan aspect because it is so powerful. But uh, the Popol Vuh is one of the only books that we have. And if you take a look at it, you see if we hadn't burnt all the other books associated with the Mayan culture, we could probably get a handle on what was going on. Um, of course, they call their, you know, where many of these gods come from, Aztlan. That's the Atlantis back there. We'd, we'd have the full picture. And uh, in fact... There are many people, and I'm one of them, who say that on the academic side, when things refer to this older culture, uh, they're intentionally left out or intentionally censored because they don't want us discovering, uh, this is something I've, I've had conversations with Carmen Bolter about, they do not want us discovering this higher mind because they're doing so well on us, uh, you know, herding us into this technological nightmare that they're developing and um, really controlling the planet. So they don't want the general population and the they, I'd say would be the establishment generally, academic or otherwise, 
they do not want the average public to discover that there was this high-minded culture back there that had all the technological stuff that we had and more and was spiritually aware and that they had to fight off this kind of egregious selfish trend and that that's the same one that we're in now so uh i think that people like steiner like casey by living the life and by you know their their work stands the test of time we've learned so much through them uh about our real past and that's so valuable their lives and the value that they have for us are inestimable all right wow great questions okay, yeah they're all amazing tonight Similar well, hold on before we go any further remember you're watching darkjournalist.com uh go to darkjournalist.com sign up for the newsletter this is the time to do it to keep us in touch all that stuff's going to get added um the newsletter is free and it keeps us you know you get like a, a new newsletter about once a week telling you what shows are coming up and so on it's going to be very important uh, for you guys to be signed up so make sure you do it if you've been procrastinating don't worry mm -hmm. about it just go over there and do it um get behind the show also support the efforts that we're doing become a subscriber um we worked it out it's it's basically about four dollars a month and you get um you know you're going to want to be a subscriber this summer because there's some major su surprises coming up for our subscribers and for the people who have been supporting the show i want to say um, you've done a tremendous job of, of putting it out there and um, we really appreciate it because you know that's the super effort that we're making on our side and I'm the same way I get behind the things uh, and the people that I think are important in the space that we're in how important is this information uh, that we're talking about and you know I, I still am in awe of the individuals and people and the mystery schools that are out there um, trying to move this information into the public realm and uh so that's a long way of saying we really appreciate it and um definitely don't hesitate to get behind things now and that are good like the dark journalist show you know and i always point out um uh, you know everyone that that we take seriously like he's a death star solari or forbidden knowledge tv it's here now we have it now so let's really use it let's get behind it and uh, getting behind the show is a, is a big thing. So we yeah. really appreciate it. Now's the time. All right. So if not, if not, <laughs> if not now, us, then <laughs> if not us who, if not now, when? Um, okay. A cult fan. Um, what was 2012 really supposed to be all about? And a cult physics asks, what does DJ think about the Mayan long count calendar? Well, it's fascinating. You can find all of the 1970s shows referring to it, call it 2011. So it's hilarious. <laughs> so we can see that 2012 was made up in a sense, but it is significant. We were in the period. Look, Casey talked about the period 1998. Um, we're in, we are in the arc and the arc is, you know, our regular everyday lives have been so transformed and an average human life regardless of what religion or what interests you have or what culture you're you're born into the average human life over the last hundred years is so drastically different <laughs> um that we know that something is going on that there's a quickening that's taking place we're being prepared for something and it looks to me that what's happening is that influence of the mystery schools coming out is coming to fruition they decided the scientific materialism is coming down and that this buffer had to be created and so the clash of those two influences that scientific materialism with all the harmonic force of controlling humanity coming down against the mystery schools who have held the information for thousands of years since atlantis opening us up to that larger group um helping us out on the mystery school side that information the clash of those two things is a, a, it's like a nuclear it makes nuclear fission looks like a firecracker. So yeah, we're, we're in the, the period. So the Mayans were absolutely pinpointing it, I think, for that reason. Um, the big marketing campaign and people who ran around saying, I'm a 2012, like, super sensible, or I'm Edgar Casey reincarnated, you know. There were a lot of dum-dums that took advantage of the stuff, <laughs> let's face it. And, um, you know, we just have to create a different type of dynamic. We take the stuff very seriously. You know, there's no dancing galactic ambassadors last time I checked in the mm -hmm. studio. If one shows up, though, we'll be sure to videotape it for everyone. Um, but the material is very important. It's fantastic enough with all, all the mm -hmm. weird fantasy. And that's why I say about 2012. I'll tell you, someone who did a really good book on 2012 science and superstition is Alexandra Bruce. I think she did a terrific job covering 
where the whole thing came from. Um, but in terms of the long count uh, calendar, look, they were so advanced, they were working with Atlantean astronomy, Atlantean geometry. We still don't know how that stuff works. So, yes. Okay. Mladen Vujovic, I think that's how you pronounce it. Fabulous. Could this alignment of all planets in our solar system ahead of us this July on the same side of the sun give us some reaction from these mystery schools? I always think that the astrological... Um, Olivia can tell you that I'm, I'm so We're big deeply, into it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we understand the power of it. Look, astrology, all it does, it's a, it's a science that was recognized in periods like the Chaldean uh, period. When you look back over those times, an astrologer would be more valuable than like, you know, a political advisor. And um, the fact that that at a certain point, the leadership was like, oh, you know, average people shouldn't know about this in the culture, let's play it down. And that's where that whole scientific materialism comes in too. It narrows down your vision. So, you know, instead of evolving, you evolve along this one track they want you to evolve around. Right? It's Miller Lite and, uh, you know, they want you to really tune into the baseball game. Hopefully it's a good one. Uh, but they, you know, there's this whole thing. They want to fill you up and sort of feed you what they want to feed you, like with um, violence and video games or whatever it happens to be. They want to keep you into that mindset which you can evolve from you know you your system becomes polluted whether it's intellectually um or spiritually you know it goes very deep so i think it's quite important um to pause and say what are the things that have been left out you know astrology gives you a much bigger picture of humanity in the world and it gives us a better idea of the planet's influence on everything that's happening here do they does that have a great influence you bet uh, absolutely. But so in terms of the actual specific alignment, I think it's interesting. I'm, I'm open to hearing about what it means. And um, but definitely watch the astrology. It's one of the things that we need to rediscover. All right. OK, so similar minds again. Great question. Um, isn't the hermetic knowledge hidden in plain sight so that only similar minds to those that encode it can understand it? It's true. Well, it's a like attracts like. That is an actual atomic function that takes place, like attracts like. And um, just like with us here, this is a very different kind of get together than you'll find in alternative media <laughs> because we're learning, you know, we're going deep. A lot of these things and people get together on the corporate media side or on certain alternative media. And it's just what I call a two minutes hate thing from 1984 where they just want to you know, lash out at everybody and say, you know, I it, take out their anger and process their uh, emotions on that. And uh, I feel like the minute you become out of your center th through anger or through, um, you know, over identification with a particular aspect, that you lose your objectivity, you lose your ability to see things as they really are. So you lose coherence. And um, the way I would kind of describe it is we're in a situation where being coherent and being centered is more important now than probably at any time in history because the forces and the technology that exists, you know, I had a conversation with a relative recently and they said something along the line of, oh, well, you know, there have always been people trying to control the world. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And I said, but yeah, you know, they haven't always had 5D <laughs> and 5G and, uh, you know, they haven't always had the kind of CERN and they haven't always had this kind of technology and the incredible surveillance and the space fence, you know, so it's different, you know, wake up. Um, so it, that's a tricky scenario we get into. I think it is important for us to realize that things are on a higher level now, but still not lose our center over it. And I think everything is designed in popular culture, uh, whether it's stories of Antifa or, uh, you know, civil war or whatever it happens to be or trying to get you whipped up about immigration or whatever it happens to be the, the design is to throw you out of your center in fact steiner called the media black magic and that i'm the more and more i think about it the more and more it's true so i guess dark journalism was, was a good name 
<laughs> okay, Lawrence Henney, does the eighth sphere appear to exhibit fluctuating patterns or changing concentrations with varying intensities and, in, and frequencies? And are the variations or fluctuations related with human activities? Well, you sound like you know it better than, than most. Mm -hmm. um, this is how they depicted the eighth sphere in those Montaigne cards. I think it's interesting, um, there's a kind of wonder to it. There's an artificiality to it. Um, I think that it's a construction that is meant to be completed at a certain point. So therefore, on a regular basis, it's taking energy. I think it's like a, you know, it's a gigantic parasite, if you think about it energy wise because it's absorbing all the time. So if you had that energy left over, if you weren't giving your energy into that program, if you weren't giving your energy into that argument, or if you weren't giving that energy into being petty, where would that energy go? You'd have the energy to evolve. So in the Gurdjieff system, they, you know, one of the things that they have is the self remembering. And the first thing that they do is they say, no, no negative, anything. You're not allowed to, you artificially, suppress negative thoughts. And um, it's quite interesting because it goes into the various ways in which a human being wastes energy. I always think, is that where the energy is going into this artificial sphere? So I, it's a great question. This picture, I'll show it again, of Vizsli Putsli sitting on this eighth sphere and having these spheres through it gives us an idea that, you know, there is a way, there's a kind of a fundamental approach to living, which leaves you not vulnerable to things like that. Um, I do think the tradition of the eighth sphere is important in this period when we're dealing so much with talk of robotics and talk of, uh, you know, sex robots and uh, talk of, all these different things in the virtual reality realm that are meant to get you away from what's actually happening. So it's drawing you in. So the fact that we're, we rediscover the eighth sphere now and it comes back strong in our thinking, in our focus, and we start to ask questions about it is, is the desired uh, condition. That's what we need to be doing is asking questions. Okay, we'll take a couple more questions. Okay, David Ward, is the eighth sphere accessible? Can we observe it from here on earth? Is the pathway into it through physical death only? or are there other pathways? I guess the question would be like, could you remote view the eighth sphere? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the thing is, the, um, the eighth sphere was very apparent to Steiner. I mean, Steiner was probably one of the best clairvoyant masters that we had on the planet. And I'm still not convinced he wasn't six people in one. But um, someone with that kind of advanced clairvoyant vision could certainly observe what's happening in terms of the eighth sphere, including, um, you know, the dynamics around it. So yes, would be the answer. Um, I think it's tricky because we have to go into it in a way which doesn't bring our imagination too much into it. We can't imagine it too much. We start to get a feel for what it is. Um, but I think that it's certainly, when we talk about virtual reality and we talk about the realm of fantasy, see fantasy can be so important so I'm, I'm, I don't want to kind of come out on the side of saying it's anti-fantasy thinking. It's because f fantasy leads to so many things that are creative in nature. But I think the idea is the balance of it. I think that's just what Steiner was getting at. It's the, you know, like daydreaming takes so much of a person's time and energy away from their actual life that they're constructing something else, you know. And, um, you know, in the Casey work, your thoughts construct your reality. So if someone is, is thinking in this kind of fantasy terms, then, you know, they're unplugging from their actual life. So there's a huge disconnect there. The, the mind-body aspect isn't together anymore. And um, it seems to me that's how you split an individual. Someone mentioned porn addiction up there. It's very important. That is exactly how you lure somebody into a state where they become vulnerable. Because those types of addictions, I mean, there's all types of different types of addictions we could talk about. 
so very often when I hear people talking about addictions and, and going on and on about these different things and listening to these shows, it did. I mean, it goes off in my ear, a little bell goes off in my ear that this is really what we're talking about. It is, that's very eight sphere oriented. So yeah, great stuff, great questions. Yeah, okay, pivoting to the crystal skull. Uh, Jalar Beer, could the crystal skull be ancient AI? Well, yes, yes. Actually, it's a good way to put it. I think what happens is, um, I'm going to tell my crystal skull story now. Okay, cool. All right, and uh, Olivia will back me up on this. Mm -hmm. What happened was we were traveling, and we were in a hotel, and we were asleep, and there was an incredible thunderstorm going on. I mean, really bad. But I had been on this trip. Of, I thought about the crystal skull. It had, you know, I'd read some things about it. And it came into my mind, but um, you know, it wasn't um, like I wasn't really. Oh, I hadn't read about it that day, but it, you know, it had been in the air a little bit. So, long story short, I, I fell asleep and I had this dream that I was in a Mexican village, and um, I was on my way to get out, and there were these very slow moving buses that were coming by, and I was, I was trying to get out of there, but it was a very quaint little place, and um, it was the daytime, and I came up to this bus. And this woman came off the bus, and she was a woman in her 30s, maybe. And she had kind of an interesting scarf on, and she was definitely a mine. And she she said something to me, and I didn't quite understand it, but I got the impression she wanted to show me something. And that she had a scarf with her, and when she un turned the scarf around, the, the crystal skull showed up. And this is all a dream, of course. And the minute that I looked at the crystal skull, the loudest thunderclap I've ever heard in my life shook the entire uh, street that we were on. And I woke up immediately after seeing that skull and the mine showing it. Uh, so for me, that stuck with me. It was like, there was some strange resonance there, or it was just a wild dream, but wow, <laughs> Olivia. Uh, yeah, but uh, there was an actual thunderclap in real life, also, I mean, which is the loudest thunderclap I've ever heard in my yeah, life. It was just like it was like an earthquake. Yeah, it just sounded like the earth snapped in two or something. And there I was in my weird dream with this woman on, you know, coming off a bus and removing this cloth and showing me the crystal skull. But it was definitely the Mitchell Hedges crystal skull, and I, I point that out a lot to people that that skull has a powerful ability. It seems to communicate, I think, even now. Okay, we'll take two more questions. Uh, well, Ice Angel is asking, um, do you think that any of the other skulls are real? And have they done any experiments with vibrations and or music with the, I guess you could go into oh, the- Oh, music, the that skull. is the way to mm -hmm. do it. Um, tone, sound, tone. This is something that Casey identified, which is how they built the pyramid. Um, and, we don't understand the power of the um, audio. We don't understand the sound magic that takes place. I do feel like um, you know there are these reports about this group that was in the Gobi Desert and nobody could attack them because they would use sound weapons um, back in you know maybe 3000 BC. Um, there's a lot with sound, I think, in terms of whether or not the crystal skulls, the other crystal skulls are real. I've never warmed up to any of them. They all feel like replicas to me. And uh, that's not a bad thing being a replica, but that true authentic skull. And I think the things that I read about the crystal skull being um, more, more authentic, the fact that it has a jawbone. Um, one of the things that I don't know if I got to read it, and maybe you can give us another question, Olivia, because I'm going to find that little piece. Well, I mean, I really think uh, Ice Angel again was asking about, wasn't the crystal basis of Atlantean power and science? Yes. Um, is it, uh, Aaron Johnson is asking, are there any connections with skulls and possible uh, vortices or portals? Well, see, portals, this is interesting. We don't understand crystal. Uh, we don't understand certain aspects in these mysteries. Why is gold always used in these religions? Now, 
if people look into alchemy, they can start to get a hint of what it is. When you look into the mystery schools and the information that they left behind in the trail, we start to get a picture of why that's so important. But on a day-to-day -day basis, do you ever say to yourself, wow, you know, precious metal, what is the big deal? Why is there always gold associated with this and with that? Well, uh, interestingly enough, these traditions talk a lot about how gold ties into our spiritual evolution. Figure that out. So crystal, as we know, pretty much runs our world now. Um, from, you know, radio to computers and everything else. So um, this is obviously a substance that has a spiritual counterpart to it. So that whole aspect of understanding what that is and how it relates to us, I think is a fascinating study for sure. In terms of portals, when you get into this information, um, you see that there are certain places that come together on the earth, which is where many of these structures are built that have magnetic influences. And that's where that X shows up. I focused on the book by George Latoura uh, in one of the episodes. And I, I haven't done enough to bring his work out. He's quite fascinating. He does a lot of work on Plato's X. And um, he's somebody who really has kind of brought forward that idea that it's a certain place at a certain time the cosmos open up and create this and that the the festivals that go on for a year like the Eleusinian uh, mysteries that went on for year after year they were waiting for this thing to happen very much like people were waiting for this grand alignment of the planets it is it's like um when you talk about a portal it's like things open up between here and somewhere else and something is allowed to flow in um that is something, this is the period that we're in. The 21st century seems to me to be, you know, target zero for that. I mean, this is really the, the period of time that we're in. Okay, we'll take one more. Uh, well, this is getting a little, let's, let me do two more. I just wanted to ask, <laughs> David Tormina was saying, uh, DJ, did you hear about CERN getting 10 times stronger yesterday? Well, is there a report? Uh, yeah, well, you know, send it to me at info at darkjournalist.com. Uh, anything like that, please. I would love to see it. I, I get information and reports on CERN, but you know, the truth is um, CERN is the kind of thing that it, it's hard to get good information on or good news on. You have to watch what they put out also. Um, but the idea that it would get 10 times stronger is kind of fascinating. And no, I hadn't heard it. Okay. Um, here's the quote I wanted to use from Frank Dorland. Dorland was the person that uh, Anna Mitchell Hedges gave the skull to and he had it for the decade of the 60s, pretty much. One thing that Dorland found was that the skull channeled lights from its base into its eye sockets, creating an awesome effect, but he was not permitted by fate to make such studies forever. In 1970, Anna showed up on Frank Dorland's doorstep and took the skull back from him, bringing it back to Ontario with her by bus. Hey, that's weird. I was talking about a bus also. Mm -hmm. um, but this idea that it channeled lights from its base into its eye sockets, someone else was doing research on it and they said, you know what, when you have the lights coming up from the base, it looks like it's on fire. I found that very interesting because the very term firestone that Casey used in relation to what the Atlanteans had in relation to the skull, obviously uh, the crystal tie over is there. Okay, we'll take one more. JJK, uh, do you believe the crystal skulls possess the ability to expand psychic abilities, like our psychic abilities? I do. Look, um, the person who has this, the crystal skull now, is it Bill Homan? Uh, he, he does. He does. He puts it out for the public. I would definitely grab an opportunity. If he, go, if he does that and he's in your town uh, or if he's anywhere near you, I would go over and check it out. I think it would have that kind of incredible impact the way that uh, you know very few relics would because um the mayan mysteries i think and the use of that skull is one of those things where you know it has that kind of life altering vibration to it uh, but it's a fascinating piece even to look at it and photograph or or uh, on video and you know there aren't a lot of pictures of it if you go to the wikipedia page that's not the crystal skull they've got a different skull up there so um Yes, definitely powerful. My God, powerful. 
Um, I just wanted to say, Aaron Johnson said one of the skulls was photographed with one of those aura cams that detects oh, uh, yes. different frequencies, and it showed a type of consciousness. Wow. And uh, the observer had a great idea. I've never heard this. Take the skull into a crop circle and see what happens. <laughs> what a wonderful idea. Maybe we could talk him into doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to get him on the program, actually, because uh, I think it's very important that uh, he was given this as an heirloom. And uh, he, he's done a great job of... Um, of keeping it safe you know I, I know that he went to do some tests on it and um there i was watching them in the lab and i was like my god i'd never let them get their hands on it <laughs> but i guess hp had their hands mm -hmm. on it um okay we will actually we'll take a couple more questions uh, leilani g why aren't there any elongated crystal skulls is it a clue to illustrate their ultimate manifestation of the homo sapien i think the elongated skulls represent something that's similar which is it seems to me that what we're looking at there is some process of expanding the pineal glands power of working through the brain and people don't bring that in enough they're so hung up on the alien aspect but those are clearly human skulls um and that's something that i need uh i think to we need to focus on more which is when you go into that research what were the skull lengthening processes all about what what were those traditions? What's at the heart of them? It seems to me it's relating directly to that psychic center again. Um, so that's a lost art. There's no question about it. And I mean, it would be pretty weird to have people walking around like that. Let's face it. Plays live. Is the crystal skull technology a 4D data medium that can be loaded into from the future? Wow. Yeah. That's terrific. Um, in a sense, I mean, it's definitely... It's like a machine in this sense, in that it holds information. Um, but I don't think that you can tap the information from the normal, regular state of mind, you know, the kind of everyday state of mind. I think you have to be in a state of tapping into your own abilities. This is the great thing I think that we find is the overlap to uh, Steiner and Casey's work, which is they say that it's all inside of you, like that great psychic ability is inside of you. So theoretically, you should be able to open up to an experience, any human being, um, to of a sacred object and be able to communicate with it and understand what it is. Um, but yeah, I think you, you would have to be in a certain type of state of mind. And it's funny, you know, there are also many things out there about like, you know, oh, do ayahuasca and with a shaman to get into a higher state of mind. I'll tell you that nothing is going to beat you kind of going into your own meditation track and becoming, um, you know, in touch with that without the benefit of any physical substance interference. That's always going to be second rate. So what you can do um, when you're not engaging with a particular substance um, is tap into that higher center, right? It's be still and know. That is the echo from those mystery schools. Um, know thyself. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, I'm getting on a high horse. There. Okay. Know thyself. Um, <laughs> All right. So similar minds again. Um, so isn't we were talking about this earlier today? Uh, isn't all the secret knowledge from the societies condensed in the most famous X, the Vitruvian Man from Leonardo da Vinci, which you had a picture of on Wednesday? Yes. But what was the first part of that? Um, basically tying the X into that? Like, is it, can't it all be boiled down into that? Well, this is interesting. There's three things about the X that are fundamental that we know. One, it's used as steganography to hide things. The groups that are doing that are very advanced technologically and spiritually and in terms of esoteric information, even if they're not working with the same purposes. Um, so it's, it's definitely being used for that. When we go back into ancient history to see the uses of the X, they seem to be hiding that thing that came out of Atlantis, which is this effect, this apotheum effect, that was a reality distorter that, in essence, took down the entire um, culture and took down the entire landmass. So there's a physical reaction there, but um, there's there seems to be this um, distortion associated with the X. So we're on the cusp of examining what that is. Now, when the Rosicrucian uh, schools, when they look at it with that whole kind of 
Rosie Cross um, mysticism, there's always an X. The, the human being is at the crossroads of those X formations. So it obviously goes a lot deeper than just hiding a treasure or hiding a secret. The secret apparently has to do with your absolute ability for spiritual evolution. So it's right at the core of who we are as humanity. And uh, so I think as we get into that X, um, we're moving into a different place. We've only had this focus on the X with what we're doing, say over four months, you know. Um, now, I've been looking at the X for a long time, but publicly, we've seen it out. I mean, you see it in, in so many different ways. I even showed the Matrix thing tonight. You know, it's kind of fascinating, but there's something to this. It's almost like uh, I use the Rosetta Stone a lot, but we have a key now that we didn't have even a little while ago. So we're looking at something in 2018, you and I here together, that we didn't have to work with. So therefore, I think the mysteries of what that is going to roll out and unfurl, you know, people send me emails all the time showing me different uses of what they've discovered about it. And, you know, uh, I think it's now in a process. It's like we're all on a roll. The dominoes are, are opening up. And this is a process that ricochets uh, are around with incredible esoteric knowledge. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I think we get an understanding of the deep state, the UFO file, and the mystery schools. That's a lot. So yeah, fascinating. I think this is a really important question. Okay. So, O. Allen, uh, what about Wikipedia saying the crystal skull is a hoax made in the 19th century when a lot of fakes were made due to interest in Mesoamerican artifacts? <laughs> this is the same Wikipedia that doesn't list that lists Robert Sarbarker as a non-existent person who was the top physicist along with Robert Oppenheimer. So not very reliable. Now, one thing that we discovered about um, Wikipedia, and this has to be borne in mind, whenever it's around psychic issues, whenever you go in there and they're always slashing together, you know, they're slashing down like Peter Herkos or Edgar Casey. some of the really, I mean, Casey's work is untouchable, but um, they need you to understand this. What I found out was that PSYCOP, uh, this group that, you know, Shermer and, and uh, like the amazing, <laughs> quote, amazing Randy and people like that came out of, that's a CIA funded operation. And PSYCOP, what they would do is they would hire interns to sit there and plunk away at Wikipedia, taking down the people they didn't approve of or they were, who they were being paid for by the CIA to take out. So Wikipedia is basically half real stuff, half agenda, uh, you know, or, or maybe three quarters agenda, one quarter real stuff. So if you're looking for the past of like a movie star, if you want to find out how much a movie grossed, uh, or if you're looking for some basic fundamental facts about geography or something, it's fine. But if you're looking for real substance, um, Wikipedia is not the way to go. It's controlled. And anything especially, you know, I had this conversation with Russell Targ when he was like, I can't believe what they've done to me in, in Wikipedia. It's total lies. It's just sitting there as a tissue of lies. So what do you do? You know, um, they're lying and Psycop takes advantage of free labor to get them to lie. So yeah, I have the low, low, low regard for Wikipedia. It's a great idea, but it's a corrupt process. Okay, you're okay. up, the last Mar question. Uh, well, people <laughs> always ask this, Marie Oliver, can you address 5G in relation to all of this, please? Well, it's here's the thing, the thing with 5G, it's, you know, it's a very dangerous situation, but the idea is that they're meeting a demand, right? People want things faster and better and all the rest of it. So instead of having these central towers send out the stuff, they're making mi little mini towers that broadcast it in your area or on your block. You'll see them popping up all over the place. People send me pictures of these things all the time. Um, the problem with the 5G is we're already in a state of entrainment in interacting with the technology, and we already see that's having a bad effect on people's consciousness. That's one. Two, the physical ramifications, like the smart grids and smart meters, you know, um, there's going to be a certain point where everyone's just getting fried by this stuff. So uh, yeah, I think just fundamentally, it has so much in common with what we're talking about. But again, it represents that physical mental domination, because physically, I dominate you by weakening your physical structure with all these rays. And uh, psychically, I weaken you because I'm sending out entrainment. So when you're playing a game, 
or if you're interacting with something, I'm sending this stuff in there to lock you in. Um, you know, and, and they have all these different ways of luring us in and getting us on the bandwagon of that technology. And uh, for me, it's control. I'd rather have the stuff without the control. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, the certain amount of agenda built into things you can appreciate. But this type of top-down control, especially for younger people uh, coming into it, you know, someone who's like 12 or 13 and developing and just being mowed down by this process, um, I think that people need to be more aware of it and far more suspicious of it. The thing is, you know, you, you need to apprehend the technology uh, and you need to work with it. But um, I think the fundamental safeguards and the dangers of it, when we talk about entrainment and all the rest of it, have to be spelled out. And it has to be the kind of thing that we're all aware of. And it loses its ability, I think, when we're aware of it that way. But yeah, great question. Fantastic show tonight. I was really happy to see everyone out here. And we had a huge crowd. Um, we're going to see you next week. So happy July 4th weekend. And... Um, the way I look at it is you're still on a holiday until next Monday and mm -hmm. then get back to work. But um, we'll see you next week. I do have a interview with Catherine Austin Fitz coming up. We weren't able to put it out because during July 4th, we decided to add some things to it that are absolutely fascinating, but she does her greatest work ever. Um, so we're going to have that for you. And then we have many exciting shows coming up. Remember to go to the website, sign up for the newsletter. The newsletter is free. Subscribe to the site, become a member, get behind it. Um, that's the kind of thing that I think that is going to be very important as we get further into the X series. The X series is going to completely uh, transform our understanding of traditional life and traditional politics and the traditional understanding of subjects of the esoteric nature of the UFO file. There's no question it has that kind of power. The next episode we're going to do you know, is Trump and Tesla. Uh, we've taken one crack at it. Now I'm going to go a lot deeper. Trump and Tesla is the next X episode, and we will see you next week. So thanks so much. And Olivia, what can I say? Unbelievable as usual. Thank you. And uh, for everybody who was asking about Trump and the Space Force, we will cover that next week. Yeah. Well, the interview with Fitz is on Trump and the Space Force, so that should help. Mm -hmm. And then we're also covering Trump and um Tesla and the Space Force. So it's going to be power packed, but I've been wanting to really get that episode done. I've done so much research. And of course, you know, I brought in um, the variants. I brought in Vannevar Bush. And um, we've got that episode out there about it. And people have really responded well to it. But I've got a lot more information to, uh, to pull down. So thank you, everyone. It was great to see everyone out there. Um, Californology. I see you. Thank you, a cult fan. It's nice to see you out there. And um, yeah, my soul on fire. It's great to have you in the chat now. Fantastic. Um, David Termina, excellent. Erica McLaughlin, of course. Um, we're happy to see everyone. And uh, Josh Rand was Josh Randall out there? He was, absolutely. Fantastic. Josh Randall does a great, great job. Uh, always the witty comments out there and mm -hmm. moves things along nicely. We will see you next week. And um, it's terrific. It's great having everyone here. Thank you so much. Have a great week, everybody. Talk to you soon. Hey, Olivia, what's for, uh, what's for dinner? Pizza and tequila. Pizza and tequila? What do you think? We're in Mexico? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>